And welcome, everybody. This is Apollo Detectives Part 6. Yes, we're back again. Oh, some of these uh, faces you'll recognise because they're faces you've been on before. We've also got some new faces. So it's a completely uh, different... It's going to be a bit different, this one, I think. And it should stand out a little bit. So I'm looking forward to that. So if we'll just bring in some of the people that are on tonight, just one at a time, ask them just briefly to introduce themselves. By the way, I should introduce myself. I am Ben Emmeline Jones, and I have been a part of Apollo Detectives since it first started, and it's really, really great to still be a part of it. It's great to be here this evening with you all. So first things first, we have the welcome return of Scott Henderson. He's back again. Hi, Scott. How are you doing? Yes. Good evening, your time. I'm calling <laughs> from Canada. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I uh, hope we have a good show. Oh, it's great to have you back, Scott. Uh, also from Canada, we got uh, another new we got a new face. So he's not been on before, but he's an author. And he's written an, an interesting looking book. I actually have a copy of it. I've not read it yet. Sorry. But it's actually Randy Walsh. So, Randy, welcome to the Apollo Detectives. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, uh, Ben. And uh, hello to everyone over there. And um, yeah, just do you wanted me to give a little bit of background of who I am? Yeah, please do. Sure. Well, um, let's see. My background is in aviation. And so I started off with private license, went up to commercial, then uh, multi-engine rating, then instrument rating, and then I added a flight instructor class three rating to that. So I've been teaching uh, basically people how to fly. So I teach the ground school and I teach them how to fly in the air. So that's been quite a fun. Um, my initial um, foray, shall I say, into the Paul mission started actually about 20 years ago. And I must say, that up until that point, um, I fully believed in the Apollo missions. I mean, I remember watching it live when Apollo 11 had, la had uh, launched. But um, it was about 20 years ago when I had come back and uh, came in from work one night. And just happened to turn on and it just happened to be watching Jim Lovell. Now, Jim Lovell, for those that are out there watching, was the commander of Apollo 13. And he was talking about his... Um, you know, the problems that they were having with the accident and how they had to sort of use the gravity system around the moon and their method of navigation. That, that was my initial um, look into what was really going on because some of the things he said I found a little interesting and uh, some of the methods that they were using for navigation was precarious to say the least. So I can get into all of that during my presentation. Mm. But that's I look forward to hearing you. You're, you. you are one of several people tonight having an actual presentation, which we're going to discuss. Yeah. But before we get onto that, we will come to, I think, Marcus, Marcus Allen, who is back again. I think you have been on all, you are our most regular Apollo detective. I think we have to call you Chief Inspector. You know, you've been on all of them, mm. haven't you? You're very How kind, you man. Thank you. <coughs> Obviously, at some point you'll say, mm. we don't want that Marcus anymore. He's completely <laughs> When people get bored of you, we'll do that, Marcus, but that <coughs> hasn't happened yet. So welcome back. I'm sure so, that the comments in the uh, comment section under this, when this is posted onto uh, the Apollo Detectives website, will tell me when I've outstayed my welcome, but it hasn't happened yet. Because one thing I would say, you can tell that I'm a very old and decrepit person who's been around so long, it's hard to remember when I started, but I have the hard copy version of everybody's virtual files. I have some of the most impressive Things such as the Apollo 11 press kit in hard copy. Wow, that's Two unique. Pages of it. I that also have the Apollo 11 workshop manual. So when they couldn't get off the moon, they will bring this with them. The Haynes <laughs> workshop manual, which would help <laughs> to repair their craft on site with WD-40. <laughs> that's what everybody uses. Did they have a, I hope it had a toolbox with it. I mean, I've got the Starship Enterprise one from that publisher. So <laughs> great. If I, can, I can cope with that. I'm sure that they can cope with the lunar module. But uh, thanks, Marcus. Thank you very much for coming back. And now we should go to one of our producers. It's Andrew Chaplin. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Hello, Ben. Uh, how's your uh, COVID-19 situation? Has that kind of disappeared now? 
I've still got this lingering cough. You know, I have got over it. And, um, of course, I've just found out that some two of the guys I uh, used to serve with in the hospital have, have passed away, sadly. It's is very right. upsetting, yeah. Um, several people in the NHS have passed away. But I, myself, I've I've recovered. But I've still got, like, a, if I'll, I'll mute if I have to cough you know, because um, – but I still still have this little lingering cough. It's um, hopefully. Uh, have you had it yet? <clears throat> no, luckily uh, I've uh, taken social distancing uh, fairly seriously and just stayed in like a boring so and so. I mean, I go running and I go kind of uh, jogging sometimes, but uh, apart from that, I just stay indoors. Oh, definitely, Andy. You've got to get your Boris's one a day. You know, you're entitled to that. But um, oh yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. Mm-hmm. Good luck. Good luck with that. Um, and now we're going to move to an, another newcomer to the apollo detectives it is blue earth thing now blue earth thing has a youtube channel and if you want to know what it is it's very simple because it's that name and um so blue welcome to the apollo detectives i think you're going to be probably our most unusual guest because you have a different opinion i think to the rest of us so we'll look forward to hearing that tell us a bit about yourself yeah I, I, hey guys i'm blue earth thing and like you said i have a i have a small youtube channel in which i just post uh, various videos about um, sometimes rockets. Uh, sometimes I go on and talk about conspiracy theorists and stuff like that. I'm actually the only one on the show I think that believes that we landed on the moon. So uh, far, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. And um, I and my background in this stuff is not anything spectacular. I'm not an expert, or anything like that. I just I just casually enjoy um, studying some space here and there, and I like talking about rocketry and airplanes and and various technical stuff um that that's basically it great well i appreciate you joining us because um we've been looking to 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 get someone who will put forward an alternative view to the ones that we we tend to talk about so thanks very much for being here blue and now finally we come in well not finally but we are coming on so there's a lot of people here tonight as you'll notice we have once again trevor weaver he's an author as well so trevor welcome back it's good to see you. i think it's your third visit to apollo detective isn't it uh, yeah, probably. Three and a half, I've had. Oh, all right, three and a half. Make it four tonight. <laughs> Last session, I always made it. Uh, my background, if anybody's interested, I started a software company in 69, in, interestingly. Uh, I had that until 79, and then I went off and I was a United Nations diplomat for uh, the remainder of my career. I retired at 49 years old, so I mean... Uh, I've had plenty of time since then. But I was a great believer uh, until, what, two years ago that we actually landed on the moon. I was convinced of it. I used to argue with my children. And that's the reason why we have the first book that I wrote, Man on the Moon, Fact or Fiction. It was to convince my children that we actually landed on the moon. I was looking for more evidence because the only thing I told them at the time was that they left retro reflectors on the moon so it must be true that was and of course that was probably one of the worst uh, things i could have given uh, well in a short time you certainly uh, made up for it in the short time you know you've, you've written another book i know which you released on the uh, 50th anniversary last year um, we discussed that once we discussed on the show what's that book called again uh i don't know actually uh <laughs> you wrote it Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> apollo moon Hulk, how did they do it it uh, describes how they actually uh, managed to uh, convince everybody, including the operatives in NASA, that it was a real thing. And I'm now well on the way with the third book, Ooh, nice. uh, which is uh, entitled uh, "Exposing." I don't know what it's titled. "Exposing the Deceit." Uh, oh, right. uh, challenging the charlatans. All right, that's, a, that's an interesting title. Well, finally this evening, last but not least, we have our pro- another producer. It is the guy who basically is, uh, along with Andy, he's one of the people who does the workhorse behind this, who does all the hard work so we don't have to. It's Neil Geddes Ward. Hi, Neil. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Ben. Hi, everybody. It's good to have another Apollo detective so quickly. So it's uh, well, this is the second one within about two weeks. So... Um, mm. That is obviously because we're allowed to do it because we have this freedom at home time now so that we've got lots of time to play. So it means that we can all go to our Nexus magazines and YouTubes and various other conspiracy websites or even books now and read up more stuff. I've spent a lot of time in the past few weeks looking through a lot of the lunar photography, finding strange anomalies on 
on the lunar surface. And that is because uh, Scott had found lots of interesting things in his research that inspired me to, to have a dig deep in some of these uh, lunar photography things. And, uh, and I found a few interesting things of late as well. So, yeah, glad to be back for another one. Nice to see everybody here. Right. I've got to thank you very much for all the editing and things you did on the last one as well, because uh, that was it came out within a couple of days. So I'm sure I joined all of us and indeed many of the viewers in expression um, my, my appreciation for that, Neil. So um, well done for that. Thank and you. also, it's, it just goes to show that new new information is always coming up when Neil brought up some completely new um, evidence, which is very interesting to talk about. So that's all of us, eight people. It's a fully packed lineup tonight, ladies and gentlemen, full house here at Apollo Detectives. But now we're going to begin with a presentation. Now, I know one agreed this beforehand. So does anyone, does anyone want to put their hand up? First one who puts their hand up gets to do their presentation first. Don't all jump at once. I think Blue should do it. Ash, oh, oh. um, nah. He, oh, you don't have one, do you, Blue? Randy's put his no, hand. No, I was Rand put Randy's hand. Okay, yeah. Randy put his hand up first. So go ahead, uh, Mr. Walsh, and give us your presentation, and we'll discuss it. Sure. Well, as I said in my introduction earlier, I think what really got my attention was uh, 20 years ago. I happened to just come in from work one evening turned on the TV and it just happened to be a documentary. Now, at the time, I didn't realize what mission they were talking about. It was an Apollo mission. But then I heard them talking about the need to use the moon as a gravity assist. I knew right away that was Apollo 13. I knew that much at that time. And then I realized the commander, Jim Lovell, um, was talking about their method of navigation. And what he was saying was, is that, uh, okay, he was sort of talking about their conversation in the uh, lunar module cockpit, and that is, you know, they needed to make a course correction. So what he was talking about was how the interaction between him and the other astronaut was, okay, he was instructing him that um, no matter what you do, when I steer, when you full power, keep the Earth within a grid pattern on the window. Now, I specifically remember him saying the grid, the grid pattern on the lunar module window. Now, that scene was actually depicted in Ron Howard's movie, Apollo 13. But that's not exactly what the official version says. But that was actually done for more for dramatics. What he was really talking about, um, or what he meant to talk about, was that they were actually looking through the optics. Now, they were looking through the optics to keep the Earth pattern, uh, the Earth within a grid pattern in the optics. Now, for those of you who don't know what the optics are, that was the part of the navigation system that they used to look through to get star sightings. So as they can then interface with the Apollo guidance computer and get a position fix. So what that told me at that point was is that they were using a combination of computer assist with visual assist. Now, for those of you who don't know much about that navigation, when you're using visual clues, you're not getting a lot of precision. Now, the reason why they had to use uh, the optics, by the way, to get a position fixed was for a simple reason, when keeping the Earth within a grid pattern, for the simple reason that they were, of course, at that point, they had moved from the command module into the lunar module during the Apollo 13 crisis you know, the explosion, the oxygen tank explosion, and so on and so forth. And when they had swung around the, the uh, moon, they needed to use that as, because remember, they were in elliptical orbit. So they were basically going to use that to, they were on a free trajectory back, and they were going to use the lunar module engine, because remember, the command module and the service module were powered down due to the explosion. So they had moved into the lunar module. So when he was talking about how they have to fire up the lunar module engine, and then um, they'd have to do a visual check to make sure that the Earth was in a grid pattern in the optics. That, to me, sounded very precarious. And that was my first, very first indication that something wasn't right here in terms of navigating. As a pilot, when you're um, using visual clues, it's actually a form of dead reckoning. So you're using dead reckoning navigation. And you're not talking a lot of precision here. And it doesn't take long for you to be off course. To use that kind of method to get yourself 240,000 miles away from the uh, moon back to the Earth is precarious to say the least. I mean, if you're off by 0 0.01 degree, you could find yourself 100, if not thousands of miles off course. So that was my first sort of um, my doubt. That was the first time I actually started having doubts because I thought that was a little bit um, peculiar given the sophistication that we were led to believe 
that uh, they were using in terms of getting there and back. So that led into, I really didn't pay much attention after that, but then about 10 years ago, I started looking into it a bit more. And I came across some, you know, I started reading all the books. And when I meet books, I'm talking about books that support the Apollo Moon missions. So I'm looking at books by space, historian, space historians. Um, you know, the one that Marcus has, I actually have a similar one. So I was looking at books like that. Also looking at, uh, you know, um, the Apollo, how Apollo foods. You know. So we're not talking conspiracy books yet, although they are important. I'm talking about books that are in support of the missions and that led me into the um situation with the saturn V rocket now for those of you out there that don't know the saturn V rocket was the record was the most powerful um rocket in terms of well the most powerful rocket ever built liquid fuel rocket ever built and just to give a little bit of a uh, brief description the saturn V rocket had three stages so you had the first second and third Okay. Now, the first stage, the all most important one, carried the five F1 engines. Now, the F1 engines are the most um, powerful engines ever produced. So that is according to NASA. Now, each engine produced a thrust of approximately 1.5 million pounds. So that's a total of about 7.5 million pounds total thrust. Now, that thrust was needed to propel the 46 ton payload um to two miles um about, i think it was uh, not to 42 miles according to nasa so about two minutes after launch about 42 miles it needed to reach that reach that altitude in order to reach its optimum orbit because that with, with the separation of saturn 5 with the sorry the first stage separation of the saturn 5 rocket would take place at 42 miles and of course then the j2 engines in the second stage would take over and then help boost it up to an earth parking orbit Okay, so I came across some very interesting things about the Saturn V, and I'll get into the testing aspect shortly, but I came across some articles in my reading, and which led me to the allus.com website, and there was one article in particular that I'd like to quote, and it's by a scientist by the name of Gennady Avchenkov, if I pronounced that correctly. So that's a Russian um, scientist, and that was translated into English for the Aulus website. And he did a very, very mathematical prose on the Saturn V F1 engines. And it's a 60-page article. It, it is, it makes some very tough reading. It's very mathematical, so it's very difficult, a lot. It takes a lot to navigate around it. But the basic premise is, is that he said, that the F1 engines were not producing the thrust that was necessary to propel the um, payload into low Earth orbit. And if you don't can't propel the payload into low Earth, or, or, low Earth orbit, then you're definitely not going to have an Apollo moon landing. So he went through, you know, step by step by step, and is uh, basically what he was saying was is that the F1 engines had to be powered back, and they had to be powered back for the simple reason that um, it, they couldn't operate at full power because to operate at full power, they would have a total breakdown of the cooling system. So briefly, um, I'm going to explain the cooling system so to give the viewer a little better understanding of what it is that uh, Achenkov was talking about. So looking at the F1 engine, um, it used... Um, that we're talking about temperature in the combustion chamber to get up to 5,000 degrees Celsius. So what they need to do is they need to keep that engine cool because obviously if you're not going to keep that engine cool, um, you're going to have an explosion. And an explosion, you're going to lose the mission. So to just go through basically the ba very basics of how a rocket engine works. So I'm going to go through, first of all, you have the fuel injector, and then you have the combustion chamber and then you have the throat, and then you have the nozzle at the bottom, which everybody sees, okay? So the whole idea is, is the fuel will go through the fuel injector, and 70% of the propellant will be sent through tubes, cooling tubes that were on the outside of the combustion chamber. Now that's very important to remember, because that was needed in order to absorb the thermal energy that was being um, produced inside the combustion chamber. In other words, the controlled explosion. 
that is necessary to eventually uh, lift the rocket off the launch pad. Now, those tubes apparently were breaking down. And that became very apparent on Apollo 6, which was the second launch and actually the second launch of Saturn V and also the second on-man launch of Saturn V. So those tubes are breaking down. So they actually tried to perform a full power uh, launch with Saturn V, but it, it didn't quite work and they almost lost the mission. I mean, the uh, Pogo effect from the uh, Saturn V during uh, the launch of Apollo 6, they almost lost the mission with that, so they had to power back the engines. So the basic premise is, and he goes through this in very, very great detail, that the cooling system that they were using was could not be used at full power. So if you cannot use the F1 engines at full power, then you no longer have the necessary uh, thrust to get an Apollo payload into Earth parking orbit. And if you can't do that, then you have no Apollo moon landings. So that's the basic premise. So I went from there and I just started looking deeper and deeper into this and discovered that <clears throat> that they had to, uh, was one other very interesting point about this is that they, after the F1 engines, after the ending of the Apollo program, it's very interesting to know that the cooling system was never used again. And to this day, the uh, NASA has now referred to using a Soviet cooling system instead of the American style cooling system for its rocket engines. So that's another point that has to be remembered. So um, that basically led into, well, um, if they couldn't get the, um, if they couldn't get the Saturn V, if they couldn't get enough payload into, so what was the whole Apollo program all about? So that's basically my, 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 my premise right now. And uh, so, you know, I'm prepared to answer questions if anybody has any. Well, thanks very much, Randy. And I mean, you've uh, basically made two separate points here. One is the, the navigation of Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. And the other is the issue to do with the Saturn V F1 engine. So, um, does anyone want to comment on on what I, I'd just said? like to add a couple of things <clears throat> is, that Rand, is that randy speaking. scott scott go ahead um not this one this is this is the official page for uh nasa for the f1 engines um it also has um slightly different uh, height at 36 miles at 6,000 RPM, or 6,000 miles per hour at 36 miles up there, which is less than the 4Gs that they were um, claiming is on its left the 36 off. Miles, is the 36 miles when the first stage separation occurs? Actually, just to interrupt, the official version, and Scott will speak to this in a second, the official version is... 42, um, miles. 42 miles two minutes after launch but as scott is going to point out that narrative is now changing slightly so uh, let scott take it from there but i think i just want to i just want to emphasize one point and this is something that you know i've been arguing back and forth with um, um for apologists for the apollo missions is that they'll come back and say well you know, Randy, the F1 engines weren't needed to get to low Earth orbit. No, specifically, if you want to break it down, that's true. But what the F1 engines were needed for, and they had to be working at full power for this to, for this to happen, is that they needed to reach a certain altitude, and that is 42 miles, two minutes after launch from the pad. And that is the significant point that needs to be made here, is that it had to reach that altitude before the J2 engines kicked in to then boost it up to Earth parking orbit. Now, if you don't reach 42 miles, and we'll get into later how we know now that it didn't, uh, two minutes after launch, then you're not going to reach Earth parking orbit, let alone low Earth orbit. You're not going to reach Earth parking orbit. So at that point, I want to emphasize is, yes, the F1 engines were not directly going to get you to low Earth orbit, but if you didn't get the Saturn V, <laughs> with the Apollo payload to a certain altitude that was calculated, supposed to have been calculated, um, naturally so, then you're not going to make it to Earth parking orbit with that uh, Apollo payload on board. And that's the point that I want to make clear, is that 
the, you have to get it to that altitude two minutes after launch for then the J2 engines to kick in and to boost it up. If you can't get to that altitude 42 uh, miles after launch, that altitude 42 miles and you're lower, then I have a question for the apologist is that then how much fuel would it be needed to have those J2 engines burn longer to get it to Earth parking orbit? Sorry, Scott. Yeah, yeah that's okay. There's, there's the second engine cut off at 109 miles that I'm showing. And there's the final shot off at 118 miles on it. But that, that's, that's, the, that's one official version. This is the other official version right up here saying that it's only uh, 36 miles at 6,000 miles an hour. And at 42 miles, you're almost at 12,000 miles an hour. And that's a huge difference. And if you want to see the detail that NASA has now given on this website, here's the PDF file for the F1 rocket engines. And if you click it, this is what you get. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make that very, very clear that uh, they are actively deleting information all of the time. Oh, so I nice. just, just wanted to put that out there because what I was looking for a few things for Randy to display and I wanted some uh, schematics of the engine. Now, there's it. a few, there's a couple of other things too. And Scott, <laughs> forgive me if I interrupt you. Um, there's That's a couple okay. of other I'm things. Pull this up and you can talk about this image here. Yeah. I'll get to that image in a second. There's a couple of other things that I do want to point out. And um, I've been asked repeatedly, well, if it wasn't 1.5 million pounds per thrust per each engine, and that's five engines, that's 7.5 million pounds of thrust, right? Then I've been asked repeatedly, well, how much thrust then was produced? And that's a question that is very difficult to answer. And in fact, even the uh, brightest minds, I haven't seen, in fact, I haven't seen a rebuttal to the article I just talked about, about that Russian scientist. I haven't seen anything about that. Um, what I, um, but what I'm repeatedly asked is, well, what is the actual, what was the actual thrust? Well, there's, there is a hint up to the actual thrust of the F1 engines, but you have to go back to 1959 because Rocketdyne was the producer of the, um, the F1 engines. And in Rocketdyne, and this was of course years before um, the Apollo program had officially started, Rocketdyne was able to get less than, it was between 900,000 to a million pounds of thrust per engine. Now that's a static test. And that data was released, that data was out long before the Apollo missions were um, put into effect. So I find that that data may be somewhat reliable. That's the only reliable data that we can go on so far. Because remember, all the telemetry information for the Apollo missions were destroyed by NASA's own admission. Yeah, they took it over. Even this, this article says they took it over in 1965. They took over Rockadine. That's right. But up until that point, especially up until 1959, I, I, I want to go back to 1959 because 1959 is, the, um, is, is, is something that, because at that point they had nothing to hide. There was no reason for them to be developing the F-1 engine. They were just experimenting. And they were trying to build, you know, there was no moon mission in the works at that point. That moon, that didn't come out until 1961, right? So, and there was a couple of years there where there was nothing to hide and that data was released. And that's basically where Bill Casing comes into play because basically Bill Casing was working for Rocketdyne and he was um, privy to the actual data. And even though they got a million pounds of thrust out of one F1 engine, we're only talking, I think it was about 200 milliseconds that they got that thrust. So it wasn't sustainable. So you have to get, you have to get into some guesstimation here. And if I was the hazard to guess, I would, I would basically say the actual output of the F1 engines was between 500 to 900,000 pounds of thrust, far less than total 7.5 million pounds of thrust that NASA claims they were able to accomplish which would it be necessary to get that 46 ton payload into Earth parking orbit? So that's the point I wanted to make there. Right. Well, this ties in a little bit with what we discussed a couple of programs ago because uh, Marcus was um, explaining about how it's very difficult to get the, the actual blueprints. I mean, you mentioned the telemetry had gone, um, the blueprints and things like that from the Apollo yeah. missions. I remember that. Yeah. Does, does anyone else uh, want to say anything about yeah. this? Can I, um, I'll come to your picture there uh, that you got there in a second, Randy. I mean, 
you was alluding to this, I think, anyway, saying that there's a yeah. point I want to make later. So maybe this is a point I don't know. But I remember reading in your book about the guy that was uh, a NASA engineer or some engineer that was on site at the Apollo 11 launch who was tasked with going to cine camera film the launch from literally the launch pad till it went out of sight. And that proved to be an invaluable piece of footage because it was a continuous two or three minute piece of footage and uh, something about the clouds when the, the uh, Saturn V reached a certain clouds. That, that's separate. it. Right. From the, so I'm bang from on. The video. So, yeah, that was, um, that was by um, an individual called uh, Phil Palacio. Uh, Phil Palacio was actually, um, he worked for IBM and he was on contract to NASA. He worked directly in the Apollo program. He worked on a couple of missions and he had shown up that morning to launch for Apollo 11 which is what you're seeing here. And he had his Super 8 uh, film camera. And, you know, he was a staunch believer. Of course, he was working for NASA, and he was very proud at that moment. And he wanted to be there to catch an historical occasion. I mean, hell, who wouldn't, right? Um, and he, what's interesting about his film at the time was is that he shot the film um, of the launch continuously. There's no breaks. So for a full two minutes, he caught the actual um, launch from the pad to the claimed altitude of 42 miles, as uh, NASA has said. And years later, he um, became very suspicious about uh, the program himself. And this is a <laughs> talk about whistleblowers. Uh, this is the biggest whistleblower I've come across so far. And he was, um, he was a little, he wanted to find out exactly what was going on. So he had submitted his film to some researchers, which I do talk about in the book. And he did a complete analysis of his film. And, and, and to, um, you know, in order for them to, the scientists who were doing the analysis, they needed to find out if this film was authentic. So they went to great lengths to authenticate the film and to make sure that there was no um, serious splices in the film, splices that would really altered dramatically the outcome and um, so they went through all that and they verified that the film itself was authentic and the photo here that you're looking at right now is uh, still from that photo and I'm going to refer to Scott in a moment because uh, Scott and Bob Williams from Apollo Detectives have done some very good work on this film and uh, I'll let Scott speak to that in a second. But I, I just want to sort of say that this man, Phil Palacio, had nothing at all to invest in questioning the Apollo missions. He was proud uh, to be a part of that. So for him to come forward, and as Scott will talk about in a second, his film shows conclusively that Apollo 11 did not reach the assigned altitude two minutes after launch which is very significant. In fact, it was far lower. It was not only, I think it was about three times lower, the speed was three times lower. Um, what you're looking, about, uh, looking at right here is, is um, uh, cumulus clouds, which is incredible because if that turns out to be cumulus clouds, which are far lower than, that, um, than the first stage separation, to, uh, cumulus clouds will go up to about 30,000 feet, but these are, these are clearly not at 30,000 feet. But, to go with the official version for a second, on the morning of um, the Apollo 11 launch, um, NASA said that there was high cirrus clouds. Now, high cirrus clouds don't normally go higher than 25, maybe 30,000 feet. They can reach 40,000 okay. feet, but it's rare. And I want to bring this point up. I want to make this point very clear, is that even – it's very interesting that NASA doesn't list – the high, the altitude of the high cirrus clouds. But interesting enough, they do list the um, altitude of the cirrus clouds that are for uh, the launch of Apollo 13 and the launch for Apollo 15, which is 25,000 feet. So the weather conditions were very comparable um, for all the launches. So it, it is safe to assume that the cirrus clouds on the launch of Apollo 13, or sorry, Apollo 11, were 25,000 feet. And here's the other point that's very interesting too, is that. Um, uh, it's, it was calculated, and I put this in the book, and I go through all this in the book, so if I forget a little bit of it, uh, if anybody's read the book recently, I should read my own book actually again. <laughs> um, it's uh, Apollo, um, when Apollo 11 went through, when, when it punched through the cirrus clouds, it was not at the altitude um, that it should have been. So 
that's all explained in the book, but that kind of definitively shows again, there's another point of view and another angle that shows that the um, Apollo 11 was not where it should have been even one minute after launch, let alone two minutes. So I just wanted to put that in before. And I'll let Scott now talk about this slide here and the work that him and Bob Williams are doing, which is really excellent. I'm actually going to be putting their work in my second book, which I'll get to later. All right. Well, okay. well, what uh, Robert and I were doing was calculating the distance uh, using the actual video. And you can actually take the length of the rocket frame by frame and calculate the distance it's traveling through that. And that's been previously done, and the article is by Popop on the uh, Aulis site as well. He's done the same thing and come out to approximately 11 miles was what it was doing at. Here's a, here's a calculator that you can get online to, to calculate your linear motion and your distance and time. And if you use that calculator and work out the fact that this is only, it's, this is uh, length, uh, height times downrange, and it keeps you underneath the clouds because the clouds aren't going to be more than six miles high. And this is separating underneath the clouds approximately 11 miles down. Okay, and the speed that it would be traveling at is just under 500 miles an hour. This chart here shows you the speed of sound as it changes over uh, height in the atmosphere and, and with height and temperature in the atmosphere, showing you the, the speed of sound is going. And at no time has every, anyone ever recorded a, a um, sonic boom from crossing the speed of sound. If you go with the official version, it's going to be within under 20 seconds from launch. It takes about 12 seconds to clear the tower. After that, it has to accelerate. And with the ne next few seconds after that, there's going to be a sonic boom, okay? If it's traveling at 6,000 miles an hour at 36 miles, even on that version, or 12,000 miles an hour at 42 miles up, there's going to be a sonic boom. And as you can see, the speed of sound here in the blue changes. It actually slows down as you go up. It's uh, here's uh, meters per second down here, 250 to 350 right here, and it's run. It's just running under the 300 up in this range here. So the the sonic boom would be there, very evident uh, within 20 seconds after the launch, and at no no time has any recording of a Saturn V rocket launching recorded a sonic boom. And just to add to to what Scott is saying, um, I mentioned in my my uh, my initial presentation Apollo the launch of Apollo six, and I just want to elaborate just a little bit more just to to show how we arrived at this. Um, Apollo 6, it's on record, they had uh, serious pogo oscillations. The pogo oscillations for the viewers that are watching is um, basically it's a vibration of the longitudinal axis of the rocket. So it's just it's a very vibrating. If there had to be astronauts on the rocket that day, they would have had to abort the mission. That's how bad that was. Now, NASA's given all kinds of indications and all kinds of, uh, you know, guesses as to what was causing the um, – the fuel lines to to break and for the uh, F1 engines to actually this is very interesting. NASA doesn't admit to the F1 engines faltering, but it was the F1 engines that were faltering that actually caused the pogo effect. NASA says that the F1 engines were working perfectly, but that's not what I have read in many researchers who actually support the Apollo missions. I'll get to that in a second. But what's important to know is is then NASA then says, oh, but just in case we did make an adjustment to the F1 engines. And apparently they made those adjustments and then seven months later, they launched the first Saturn V manned mission, not only to low Earth orbit, but to circumnavigate the moon and back. And that was Apollo 8. So in seven months from Apollo 6, from the almost disastrous mission of Apollo 6, in seven months, they went to fixing the problems without any further testing of the F1 engines. And that really was a startling um, conclusion for me. Now, this is very interesting. I read this from a space historian from America in Space series. It's called uh, Saturn V, America's Rocket to the Moon by Eugene Reichel. 
I'm sure if you look him up, he's a staunch NASA supporter. And there's a very interesting paragraph in here from him that I would like to read. And this is regarding the uh, F1 engines. And I talked about the uh, combustion instabilities of the uh, chamber and that because of the cooling system, they weren't able to maintain the uh, proper temperatures. So, um, and the cooling system is, re you have to have that cooling system working perfectly. And my uh, feeling is, and my, well, it's not my feeling, is that uh, I'm pretty sure of this, that the only way to get the F1 engines to work in any semblance of perfection is to throttle back. Now, here's a very interesting conclusion from this author. Again, Eugene Reichel. And he says this about the F1 engine instabilities and the problems they were having. And I quote, the spontaneous combustion instabilities never reappeared until the end. However, the problem was never completely understood. In other words, he's saying it right there. We fixed it, but we don't know how. <laughs> so then he says, to this day, it remains a constant problem, large rocket engines for which an individual empirical solution has to be found. Now he's saying that, well, we fixed it then, but we don't know what the problem is now. And then he says, to the disappointment of the engineers, a model was never found which they could generally overcome the problem. That is regarding the F1 engines and the perfection that we are told worked to get the Apollo missions to the moon and back. Right. Well, there's a massive yeah. amount of... Thanks very much for that, Randy and Scott. I appreciate you, that long, detailed presentation there. There's a massive amount of material there. I'd, I'd love to know what Blue thinks about this, because I know yeah. he has a different view. Um, obviously, there's a lot here, Blue, but just take your pick yeah, from the there, points there that have been made. Okay. I wrote a couple of things down. First off, I, I truly do think that Randy's overplaying the, the tremendous failure that is Apollo 6, because... It worked, and mission was accomplished. They tested the engines, they tested the set, the rocket, and everything like that. It didn't reach its um, prime altitude, but that's not just because of the F1 engine's failures. That's because also the J2 engines had problems, and the engines after that. There was a lot of problems with that, but it still succeeded. And I don't, I don't see that as a problem for Apollo. In fact, I see that as just the opposite. It that is the test. And then they went in and fixed it. We do the same. I do the same things all the time. When um, a little backstory about me is that I, uh, my family, we race race cars. And I know you're going to go, oh, Saturn V rocket to race cars. That's, there's nothing that's similar. But we have problems like this all the time where we have to fix this something really quickly. And then we don't get to test it before we go out and try to win a race. And it works a lot because we understand our engine very, very closely. And that's how these engineers understood each individual F1 engine. As you know, each individual F1 engine was not the same. They were all different, every one of them. And they had specific engineers assigned to each engine to keep them running. That's I could see that easily as one of the reasons why there's not a single model for all the F1 engines because they're all different, even though they're manufactured basically the same. And we see the same thing with um, with what I work with, race car engines. These race car engines are made by the same person, by the same parts, in the same manner, from the same blueprints, but they all turn out different. So I think that's just a problem that happens when you get very high-powered um, engines of really any kind. And so I don't see a problem here. I don't see any um, thing that needs to be hidden. I don't see issues. Uh, another thing is... You were talking about how uh, NASA doesn't admit that th there was a problem with Apollo 6. Is that correct? No, that's not what I said. Or what did you? Can you say it again? I said NASA doesn't admit to a problems with the F1 engines. I never said they didn't. A okay. They do admit to a problem with Apollo engines. 6. All right. Uh, if you go to the Huntsville Space Flight Center, or if you go to Huntsville, the, the Space Center, and they have a little booth, there that specifically is about the problems of the F1 engine. Right, yeah. and I just spoke to that problem, what and I'd like to respond to your first point, Okay, um, is that what you're talking about is good, it's all well and good, and actually I agree with you to a point, but we're not talking about a history of engines leading up to high-powered engines. We're talking about a very unique engine, the F1 engine, that was only tested in actual conditions of flight twice for a total of um, four minutes. So um, technology being what it is, always goes through peaks and valleys, and, those and there has to be always numerous testing done. We see this all the time in the aviation industry. 
So uh, what I'm saying is, is that the problems that were admitted pro admit to problems with the F1 engines, those problems were never retested again before the launch of Apollo 8. And I've never seen any example of that in any other industry where a problem is not tested first, fixed, and then tested before an actual mission. First one, um, you said that the Apollo engines were only tested for four minutes in flight? Uh-uh. Hold on. Let's just clarify. They were okay. actually tested for 70 hours in static testing. So okay. I left the static Good. testing so I was going to make sure that you leave that in because that's also yeah. that's very important. That's you can't in my sit book. here and state that it's yeah, only in that's flight. That's in my book. But okay. I'll finish this point. That total of uh, so 70 hours of testing, which seems um, adequate enough, right? But now I've got all the detail in my book, so forgive me if I have to actually go search for it here. Can I, ask a, question, actually, can I just ask a question of clarification? Yeah. Um, you refer to static testing. Now, is this um, presumably oh. this means that the rocket's not actually in flight when the engines that's are right. actually ignited? Yeah, it's that's right. right. Yes. Yeah, that's static testing. Now, static testing is important. I mean, in aviation, you have static testing of jet engines all the time. I mean, that's an, an integral part of any um, new technology. You yeah. want to do static testing first. And then keep in mind is the static testing is done under very controlled conditions. The whole idea then, you take it to the next step where you have, um, you want to test the uh, aircraft engines in uh, actual conditions of flight. And that is in atmospheric conditions because now you've got many different forces that are acting on that engine. So you can have an engine working perfectly in static conditions, but now you want to see if that you can duplicate that in actual flight conditions. We're not, right. seeing, that, we're not seeing that with the F1 engines. Okay. I'd like to carry on, uh, Blue Earth, with your point. Why, do, why do we need it? Pardon me? Why would you need it in that short amount of time? I mean, first off, the engines on the Apollo, when, when the Apollo 6 launched, if you were to have people in that capsule, they would have come home perfectly safe. The, oh, uh, what, what mission was that? The, with the, if there were people in the in the Apollo Six capsule, they would have come home perfectly safe. Where are you getting? Where are you getting that information? I'm getting that information from just basically estimates, seeing that it didn't blow up. The capsule did return pretty darn safely. It's in one no, piece. You're saying, hold on a second. I want to know the, where how you came to that conclusion because NASA does admit to severe poker problems. I hold came to that second. conclusion because. NASA the severe POGO problems that were so bad it disrupted the fuel uh -huh. lines and cut off the J-2 engines. So yes, it did all that. Right. Situation. So how would they have right. gotten back safe? It, it did damage the limb that was inside, the stand-in limb, and That's all that things. But the, cap the capsule in which the astronauts would have been housed in was perfectly fine throughout the oh, entire okay. thing. Well, and it's for sitting on fine Earth. From where? Fine from where? Like, uh, I can literally just show you a picture of it sitting on Earth right now. No, no, I'm just talking about that. You can have a, a capsule that may look perfect, but we're talking about the contents of the capsule. What it would have done to the astronauts. Did they go into Earth orbit? Is that what you're saying? And then, can, uh, uh, oh, sorry. I mean, it, it did go into Earth orbit, 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 and it did orbit. return. It, what? It, what? it returned in good enough condition in which NASA decided, hey, it's fine that we can actually put people on this and try this again. Okay, but what are you basing that on? That's what I need to know. I'm basing that on in the events that happened. The, the events, events that happened. happened. So let's go through the events well, that happened. Explain they the events launched. that happened first. Hold on. Can I talk, please? Sure. Can I talk? I sat through like 20 minutes of you. All right, can I talk? They, <laughs> they launched a rocket. Yeah. It basically accomplished what they went for it to do. Right. Okay. It tested the engines. It tested the things. They figured out the problems that were on the rocket. Right. They know what the problems are. So right. then they go, this thing returns. We have a capsule sand sitting here. We have a deadline we got to make, and we have money. F1 engines cost a crap ton of money. These rockets cost a, just so much money. We have to send somebody up. It's logical for me that they would put somebody in their capsule, send it up, and send it back down when it was just proven that that could happen. And they can they have the few months to fix the the next engines, make sure the problem doesn't happen again. And guess what? We saw that happen. We saw it happen. We saw the next rocket go up, Apollo Seven, go up. They didn't have hardly any problems other than a cold and a small mutiny. Apollo um, what? Which one was that? Apollo Seven. Apollo Seven was not a Saturn V launch. 
Oh yeah, good point. Sorry, thank you. I was try I was trying to um get that into my video. I was trying to throw in a little a snide comment for my last YouTube video. Um, I was trying I was trying to plug that in. Uh, I did that too, too bad. But no, um, you're right. You're right. But by the time they did send up the next Apollo Apollo rocket, there really weren't that many problems. Okay, so uh, okay. Are, sorry, are you are you done? I don't mean to interrupt you again. Uh, yeah, I'm done on this topic. I've got one more I want to talk about with the sonic boom after okay. this, and and I'll let you get to that in a second if you don't mind. I just want to respond to the first part. Um, you're basing it on schedule. Is that what you said? You're basing your conclusions on the schedule. Uh, I'm to... basing it on his on what happened. Okay, no, I just want I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Answer? Straight what NASA says. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, you you want to? I know you want to talk about the sonic boom, Blue. Um, but after that, I'm, I'll ask you. Another, I've got another question for you after okay. that about the other points. But um, but then I know the rest of you might want to say something as well. But um, Blue, do you want to mention the sonic boom issue? Oh, yeah. Um. So you were talking about how there's never been a sonic boom um, recorded. Like no one's actually um, captured the sonic. Who said that again? Scott. It was Scott who said that. Scott, is that what you were saying, Scott? Oh, he's unmuted. I'm yeah. Scott. Okay. Yes, yes, of course you heard me. Yeah, 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 yeah. I said. Okay. Um, hold on. Do you mind if I post something in the side chat? You can you can Google all you want. You won't find a video with a sonic boom in it. But go ahead, Blue. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, if if there wasn't a sonic boom, I like I'm kind of curious because it's pa it's pasting. It's taking a while to paste. Apparently, it's a large picture. Uh, there it is in the side chat. Um, I'm kind of curious as to what you think that is. That? Even the vapor, they're like there's vapor coming off it. Photograph. it. It looks like a sonic boom to me. I can look at sonic booms of airplanes all night, all day long. That, that looks like a sonic boom to me. Well, give me the audio of it. Uh, let's see. That, 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 that is a composite photograph you've just pulled up is it now are composite no. photographs fake you're referring to the cloud of vapor about halfway up the rocket's body is that, the, is that what you mean uh yeah right now i'm i'm referring to that okay cheers. I, I can pull up pictures of other rockets doing sonic booms and it looks the exact same Okay. Uh, can I ask a bit? I know, I know, Marcus, I know you want to say something in a little while, and Andy and Neil will too. Uh, but can I just ask um, Blue? Now, Randy and Scott made other points as well. Now, earlier on, we were talking about Apollo 13 and the navigation issue, because this is something that came up on a previous episode of uh, the, where Marcus and I would, and several other people were discussing this. Um, what, do you, what do you know about the, the navigation issue that uh, Trevor brought up? Uh, not much, to be honest. Um, I'm not an expert in, um, naval navigation. Okay, Simple no as that. Uh, I'm okay. not an expert in that. No worries. Uh, yeah. Marcus, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just really looking at uh, what we're discussing there. I think <clears throat> Randy's made some very good points in terms of testing, but also the use of the film, the, the IBM engineers film, which I think we can all agree has been accepted as unedited, uncut. So it shows what actually happened. And to see the rocket moving through the Sirius clouds where you can see its shadow being cast on the upper uh, upper side of the Sirius cloud means that you can time it very precisely. Now, if you're going to achieve a certain speed, you need a certain amount of power behind you given the weight that you're carrying. And I usually say, well, you can Take a Ford Fiesta with 100 uh, horsepower, and it will get from 0 to 60 in, let's say, 10 seconds. You can take a Ferrari 358 with 400 horsepower, and it will get from 0 to 60 in 4 seconds, or maybe a bit less. The point is that it's the power that's available to do it that moves the, the uh, weight that you're moving. The same would apply to a rocket. So if there isn't enough power to move it fast enough to reach the speed it has to achieve to get to its objective, which is cut-off point at 42 miles and then launching from there up to 118 miles, you need a certain amount of power. 
if you're if it's carrying the weight it is now if it didn't have the weight on the rocket because there wasn't enough fuel or the fuel was not sufficient it wasn't carrying the weight we're told it carried into low earth orbit and from then on into uh, translunar injection which is 46 tons to the moon so what what Randy I think has has made a case for is that there wasn't sufficient power being generated by the the F1 engines. We know what they're supposed to generate, but the question is, did they actually generate it? Did they generate the 1.5 million pounds of thrust each? And if, as you say, it was generating say 900 thousand pounds per thrust, that means it wasn't it didn't have the power to launch what we're told it launched. I think 50 years later, we're seeing the same problem with the space launch system that is supposed to be able to launch the same weight, 130 tons, into low Earth orbit. You know, that's great advance in scientific uh, achievement in the last 50 years that they can't do any more than 130 tons. <clears throat> but that's beside the point. They still haven't launched the damn thing yet. So why don't they dig out the old uh, Saturn V rockets? They've got an engine that Alan, uh, to Jeff Bezos dug out of the Atlantic and just back engineer the thing. It can't be beyond the wit of man to do that. Because the Saturn V rocket, if it was as successful as we're told it was, would achieve what the space launch system is now designed to do. But if it couldn't do it, that would explain A, why the shuttle had to be developed, <clears throat> because the thing couldn't lift the shuttle into low Earth orbit either. It took 10 years to get the shuttle uh, program up and running. And why don't they just try to recreate some of, some of what was successful with the space launch system? It, it, it's not making much sense. This is, this is one of the major problems about the, uh, what we discuss at considerable length and in some detail. It just doesn't make sense in terms of the 50 years of development which is supposed to have happened. Either NASA have gone backwards which is a, a terrible indictment on them, or they never achieved what they said they achieved 50 years ago. We will soon find out if it was true or not, because President Trump doesn't like people who don't do what they say they will do, which is go back to the moon. That's it. We, on the last program, we were talking about the, the whole thing. I, I myself do wonder, I mean, because I mean, I, I'm too young to remember this, but I do know that from the science fiction from the 60s, I was I'm keen on Arthur C. Clarke and, and people like that. And I do, I do some, when I, was, when I was a little kid, I used to think I would look, I used to look forward to the thought that I could take my holidays on the moon when I was an adult. And, um, well, I think uh, Lytham St. Anne's is the furthest I've got since then. So, um, I suppose I, it does seem like progress reached a certain point. It happened very quickly within the first decade of the space race, and then it seemed to stop. And that's, I mean, of course, there were deep space probes and things like that, and there was the International Space Station. The Russians put some people on, on orbiting platforms. But it wasn't what was predicted by space and science fiction and um, enthusiasts at the time. So that was a big disappointment. I'm sure anyone from that era who could see forward to the present day would gasp in dismay. Yeah, it's 2020. <laughs> but, so does, does anyone else want to add anything there? Yeah, can I can I respond to the whole technology thing? Of course. I, I think that the idea that technology has stagnated or NASA has gone backwards in technology is ridiculous. I mean, we're seeing ourselves putting incredible probes and rovers on Mars. We're seeing uh, landing things on comets. Uh, the idea that we moved backwards is just <clears throat> insulting, honestly. Uh, to it, it's, any of my human friends. Space, it's human space flight that we're talking we about. We don't need it. Yeah. That's the thing. We don't need it. The only reason why we're going back to the moon is so we can go to Mars. And we just got to the, <sighs> we just got to the point where we have enough budget to even try that. And we, ha and we know enough about Mars to even do it. Um, I'll, I'll, sure be using, I'll be using right Russian Soyuz rockets to send uh, things up to the International I, Space Station. Be, the reason why we're using Soyuz rockets is because it's, so, it's easy. It's easy. So, so surely, surely NASA technology would be far in advance of Russia. First off, what one? Why would um, we have the rocket that's cheap enough to do it? It's reliable enough to do it. Why in the world would we be um, needing it 
more. And why would you be putting resources? Because I because I would have thought because I thought your argument would be why that NASA are so far in listen, advance that they would they would you know be able to do it better than the Russians. Surely, listen to me. Why would we be putting the massive amounts of resources in, which we did at one point? It's called the space shuttle, which space shuttle was more advanced than the Saturn V. But why would we be putting in all these resources when we have the practical use? We have the easy cheapest way to get back and forth between the ISS or all the nations and why would we be putting our resources there when we could put them other places and doing right, things right. that no other nation has ever done Randy, instead of you want to say something Randy? Instead of getting back and yeah. forth between the ISS why aren't we putting res why would we be putting resources between getting back and forth between the ISS <laughs> instead of putting it towards uh landers on Mars landers on Venus landers on comets uh and I don't understand why you expect us to be going uh, to the moon in this in that different period. I don't understand that because, because I thought that the technology would be advanced enough to do it cheaply and more efficiently, <coughs> better than the Russians would do it. Well, Randy, do you want to say something? Yeah, there's there's a couple of points I would like to address regarding um, what uh, has been talked about. Um, first of all, it's important to note that. The United States government funds the ISS um, about, I think it's three quarters to the other countries that are involved in that. So they're paying three quarters the cost, which I think it's about $150 billion or 200 total. And I think the United States has put in $150 billion. And that's very interesting. And I think it's a very fair question to ask, well, if you're putting that amount of money, which is equivalent to the money they spent on the uh, alleged Apollo missions, I think it's a fair question to ask, why couldn't you set some of that money aside to build on the technology that we had 50 years ago to be able to get their own astronauts to the ISS? And I think there's another important we point. We did. To, uh, okay, there's another important point to bring, into, uh, uh, to bring out here is that we're experiencing, as we speak, a lot of political instability between uh, you know, countries around the world, especially between Russia and the United States and Russia at any point, and they wouldn't do this despite anyone, but at any point they can announce that they're ending their manned space program. So what happens to the ISS if that happens? Because if you have one country in the world that's using 50 year old technology as its means to get to the space station and that program ends, what happens to the ISS? And I think that's a fair question to ask too. I don't have the an answer, but that's the modern question. Soyuz is not 50 year technology. The modern so each one of those rocket those rockets were not made fifty years ago. They're currently being made. Okay. Now they're based well, on a fifty year old rocket. I'll let you finish. I'll let you finish. That, but uh, all the Soyuz that, rockets, the fifty year old technology, is like, one, one at a time, guys, please. Based based on, one at a time. Said you let me finish. You said you let me finish. Okay. Uh, the Soyuz rock to call the Soyuz rocket fifty year old technology is basically like calling the Corvette a sixty year old car. Just. They keep doing advancements and they keep making it better and better and better. That's kind of the point of making the new rockets that keep going up to space. They didn't make 100 rockets 50 years ago, and they're reusing those. Now, of course, they're going to be reusing parts. They're reusing the um, general idea of it. But the Soyuz rocket was a beautiful rocket. I mean, this sucker, even 50 years ago, it, it was incredible. It got the job done very well. So I don't expect there to be a lot of stuff. So, um, another example would be the B-2 bomber. It's just a near-perfect bomber. You why haven't the Russians put man on moon? The Russians didn't put a man on the moon because they didn't want to put. They didn't try to put a man on the moon. Yeah, they had the uh, the, the the massive triangle cone-looking rocket that I, I that they launched once and it utterly failed. But they never put any research into science. But all you just said they have a beautiful rocket, so surely they, they would have a, a, a better way of getting man on the moon. Yeah, because they got freaking lucky. Lucky. Yes, they got lucky and designed a beautiful rocket to do the one things, the, the, the very early bits of the uh, space, um, space race, and it worked fantastic, and it's been used ever since, and it's been improved upon and improved upon and improved upon in small bits, and that's the current Soyuz rocket that we have today. So then why hasn't it been to the moon? When he, it doesn't have the power to go to the moon. Why does it need to go to the moon? It's why, not why don't they create a rocket based on that Jeez. to go to the moon? <laughs> You know, you can't do that. You, you, can't do that. you, you just said that the Russians have better technology than the Americans, that they have a beautiful oh rocket. What in the world makes you expect you for that to happen? Why wouldn't they? There's a space race going on. 
It was called the N1 rocket that the Russians. Yeah, N1. Done. There, you, I want. I didn't want to get the name wrong, but yeah, the N1 N1 rocket was the big cone triangle thing That's that the, they tried to launch once. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, what, I know what that's reason a, did they have to take the Soyuz rocket and try to go to the moon? Heck, our Atlas rockets are working fantastic. Our Atlas rockets are, have been used since basically the beginning of the space race too, and still being used to this day. Why haven't we taken the Atlas rocket to the moon? It's because got it's and engines in it too. Um, I, to, to, Andy, I think, am I correct in saying the point you want to make is, you know, seeing as we did land, supposedly did land someone on the moon, mm. why didn't we keep going there? Why don't we? I know I, uh, you did I, say I, it wasn't necessary. I think there's a kind of a contradiction. Yeah, but, but yeah. There's a contra contradiction between the argument that the Russians have made a fantastically beautiful rocket that's uh, almost far in advance of anything that the Americans no, have created. It wasn't far in advance of anything. It did its job perfectly. Okay, but then, but then, why did they just stop and and say, you know what, they we're not even going to bother? They didn't just stop. They're still doing it to this day. Okay, so name they a Russian say astronaut. That they just stopped. They, 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 name they, a Russian they, cosmonaut that actually they stepped advanced, they, the they they made rockets and they made technology that landed on Venus. They were the first ones to do that. Fantastic. So how how come they haven't sent a man to the moon? Well, currently, there's no reason to. They got beat to the moon. We did all the science, and Amer America did all the science. And there's been no reason to go that, back. That's not what possible. Right. What, surely, what, yeah, surely it'd be a great thing to go back, wouldn't it? I mean, sure. to have a, a base on the moon or something. What you have? You know, that's I'd, not that's not what's science. The science is not about competition. That's not about competition. It's about whoever got there first. Big deal. The point is, is that <laughs> Trump recently announced that there's important minerals that need to be mined off the moon, and they want to send a manned mission back. That's not why they're going back. Why are they going? Well, they never went. They're going place. back. They're going back. Why are they going back? Up. They're going back to learn how to go to Mars. They're going back to learn how to go to Mars. Well, how about we learn how to go to the moon first? We already know how to go to the moon. We've yeah. done it six Your times. Opinion. You know where? Yeah, right. No, that's we, not my opinion. That's the shown. fact that would happen. And and as of right now, there's been no one. No one has been able to put together a rel relatively good argument to say that they didn't. Okay, well, that's that's. I think that's the point we're trying to make though with this series of programs. But sure, I, can, yeah, that is. Hmm. But it hasn't happened. Okay, well, uh, does anyone and else want to say anything? Because the idea of yeah, you're right, Scott. Um, I have a question. It's it's concerning the navigation, if I may. Uh, Randy talked about the points of navigation on Apollo 13. Uh, you mentioned it in the book, and they used a I forget what the device was called, like a scope. Yeah, to it look was, through. Um, it was actually called uh, sextant. Sextant, that's yeah. right. So, so it's like a like a, almost like a periscope. I I gathered where they could look through and they'd see the stars through it and line up the stars with their scale or something. Yeah. So basically, um, what they modeled it after, after was celestial navigation that sailors have been using for hundreds of years. Right. Uh, okay. And that, and that worked fairly well for hundreds of years, even though it was never pinpoint accuracy. And they would use the stars in alignment with the Earth's horizon and, you know, get a position fix and then plan their course. But it's important to remember that, uh, or it's important to note, rather, that celestial navigation doesn't um, maintain course. It just gives you a position fix, and then you have to project where you're going from there. That's the method that the Apollo guidance computer used. The Gal Apollo guidance computer required crew interface. So it required them looking through the optics, the sextant, so you'd have a telescope at one times magnification and one I think was at 60 times magnification to get to uh, two star sightings and then to allow um, take readings from the star sightings and either the Earth's horizon and the Moon's horizon and then put those coordinates into the Apollo guidance computer and then use that to um, align the uh, inertial measuring unit as well as get a position fix and then project where you're going from there. That was their method mm. of navigation. Okay. Uh, if anybody can see a problem with that, I, I don't know how else to explain it. No, that's very good. That's very good. The um, So what I'm getting at is the Apollo 11 press conference when they returned from their mission, Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick Moore, uh, our yeah. British astronomer of late, asked uh, the crew, um, could you see the stars from the surface of the moon, and there was a kind of slight pause and an embarrassment and things like that, and there was shuffling of feet and pens. And then Mike Collins, who was the navigator, says, I don't remember seeing any stars. And he wasn't even the guy that went down onto the moon. So my point is, if he said, I don't remember seeing any stars, and yet he was the guy supposedly looking through this sextant device at stars to get them there and back. Yeah, can I speak to that? Um, that's a very interesting point. Um, and we have to also keep in mind 
that on the Gemini missions, I believe Mike Collins was talking about the abundance of stars that he was able yeah. to see while in low Earth orbit. And also keep in mind that for half of his orbit around the moon, he was on the dark side of the moon. So yeah. he would have seen the stars very clearly. If he didn't see them on the other side, he certainly would have saw them there. But as you pointed out, he uh, wasn't, number one, wasn't on the lunar surface. And number two, you see, he was correcting Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong actually made a mistake. So he was trying to correct for him. And in the transcripts, I haven't got it here, but in the transcripts, that's actually reversed, which is very interesting uh, point in of itself. That's a matter for another time. But um, I, well, I just want to add a footnote to that mm -hmm. because a lot of uh, uh, people would say to me, well, Randy, you know, we couldn't, you know, there was no photos of the stars and lunar surface because of the cameras. They weren't set for that. The aperture wasn't set for that reading. Now, I'm not an expert. Don't pretend to be when it comes to photographic uh, um, you know, the photographic evidence. So, um, but my argument is, okay, that makes sense to me, actually. Um, I can, I can accept that. Why not bring another camera? Now they did apparently on Apollo 16, they brought the ultraviolet light camera that was supposed to have taken some star patterns from the lunar surface, but that was the only one. I'm just wondering why they, and this is neither important or not, neither proves, nor, uh, or proves or doesn't prove the Apollo mission. I'm just pointing it out there that, you know, with all that technology, it could have easily bought another camera. But there's one more point I want to make. When the, and this, I'm just going by the official transcripts, when the um, service module was in orbit, so when Mike Collins was in orbit around the moon, while Neil and Buzz were allegedly walking on the moon, the uh, service camera, uh, uh, the camera in the, uh, and I think Scott has some photos of this, in the service bay of the command module was taking continuous, not only mapping the surface of the moon, but was taking photos of the stars. And I can't find those photos anywhere. So I contacted NASA and I was redirected to several other agencies and none of them have those photos, which I, again, find a little peculiar. I just mm. want to add that out. No, uh, Marcus, you've... Um... This this idea of light and photography this is your speciality. Yeah. Um, have you heard of these fo um, the photographs that are taken in orbit and things like that? Um, can you add anything to that? They, uh, there were certainly photographs taken in orbit, um, but most of them were taken on the lunar surface. And I, I think it's a very valid point to say that yes, there were supposedly photographs taken from the command module the whole time that it was being it was in orbit around the moon. But if the photographs don't exist or can't be found, could the answer be that the camera was retrieved doing a spacewalk on the return journey back to the Earth, assuming they were on the moon, on the return journey back to the Earth, they had to do a spacewalk to recover the camera. Now, we already established in, in other areas that photographic film does not survive in a vacuum. And we know that there will be a vacuum in space. Could it be that the camera was recovered, but the film was so badly damaged it showed nothing? I don't know, but it's it's a it's it's a red flag that the photographs that allegedly were taken by this command module camera don't appear to exist. Mm -hmm. And there is, there are so many anomalies around the photographic evidence, which is basically what is put forward by many people as being definitive evidence for man setting foot on the lunar surface. There are so many problems with it. Marcus, did you say that you've got some new evidence that's not been seen before? Well, it, it, it's going back to what we were discussing at the end of our, of our last episode, which was from this book, For All Mankind. Now, this was the first book that I bought. It was published for the 20th anniversary in 1989. For All Mankind, it's taken from the, uh, the plaque that... Apollo 11 had, you know, We Come in Peace for All Mankind, written by Harry Hurt III. And it's a, it, it's a pretty standard book in terms of what it rec recounts of the Apollo program, and it's very straightforward. It's very well, it's amusingly written. Harry Hurt's a good author. Uh, he may have made a few errors in the book, um, spelling Charlie Duke's name, Charlie I-E instead of E-Y. Mm -hmm. Sort of small errors, which could have been picked up by a good editor. But at the end of the book, right at the end, I'd just like to read a very, very short passage, which uh, is what struck me at the time. And this is 1990. I bought the book in Glastonbury. Where else did you buy books like this? 
And this is looking at the, it, it, it's, it's in the epilogue of his book, The Message of Apollo says, Shortly after the Apollo 11 and 12 missions, NASA Public Affairs Officer Julian Shear mischievously fueled the flames of doubt at the 10th annual meeting of a drinking fraternity known as the Man Will Never Fly Memorial <laughs> Society. Shear delighted some 200 admittedly inebriated members of the society by narrating a film of astronaut training exercises at a terrestrial moonscape in Michigan that bore an indistinguishable resemblance to the real lunar surface. The purpose of this film is to indicate that you can really fake things on the ground <laughs> to the point of deception, she informed his audience, oh, deliberately no. inviting them to come to your own decision about whether or not man actually walked on the moon. Now, of course, that can be totally dismissed as being just a bit of humor at the end and acknowledgement of the, after 20 years, the uh, raising of the doubts about Apollo. But why even bother to mention it? Why is it necessary? They're, they're naming uh, Julian Shear, who was a PR man for NASA. He was quite a prominent person around at the time. He's with NASA for many years. Why would he bother to narrate a film deceptively informing the audience that this was on the lunar surface? It makes no sense. And it was probably that one paragraph which piqued my interest to the point where 27 years late, 29 years later, good God, time flies when having fun, trying to find the answer to that question. Was it real or was it not? I'm still working on it. And I bought, in, I mean, I'm old enough to buy books. <laughs> These are some of the books. I mean, this is 50 pounds worth of book. This is Norman Mailer's account of the Apollo 11 missions, Moonfire. It's a great book, huge book. And then there's the even bigger one by Andrew Chaitkin, Man on the Moon in three volumes. Mm -hmm. But God, oh, cool. oh, yeah. how much information do you need? It's all there. It's certainly something to read during the quarantine, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. Exactly. So, does, does anyone need to... We've been going now, you know, for about an hour and a half, so does it? Does anyone um, feel like they need to have a break? Yes. Oh, sorry, Marcus, had you finished? No, so just carry, on, I, mate. carry on. I'd like to make for Neil, in, your, in the last time we were looking at some of those weird things in the Apollo um, photographs. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I've got, and I mentioned at the time that there was a picture in this book. This is Full Moon by, by, the, by Andrew Chaitkin. And it actually shows a picture with exactly what you were pointing out. Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can see it. This is Apollo 17. And at the bottom here, I've got it in place. Yeah, the bottom here, there are two little rocks there, two little rocks there. That's a duplicated image, and you can see it on the picture. They haven't really tried to hide it very much. Marcus, has um, Scott got that on his computer that we could? Because that your your, uh, your webcam is very grainy yeah. at the moment. I don't know if there's a better version we can have on desktop. Um, I I probably have the original, and that's probably been uh, modified for the magazine or the book. That, that, that it's it's the uh, dupe, it's the, the Tracy's it's rock on Apollo seventeen split yeah. rock yes it's there are three images if you find the original and it doesn't have that additional bit at the bottom I can have it in a moment okay does it have a is file some... number on that <coughs> image is, um... is there a file number on that image Hold a just give me thing. I tell you what we could do. We could have a break, and then maybe when Marcus has, has found oh. it, we can we can bring it up. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Let's Does anyone uh, fancy? Anyone needs to it. take yeah. it up? Anti gravity on the moon. I think this is the one you're probably referring to, isn't it? Yes, I'm. I'm pretty sure it is. If it's showing the beach volleyball player. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. That's the one. And we have to zoom ahead. And we're in the further.
Yeah, there you are. That's the one, yeah. Yeah. This was a trailer for the second book. Okay. It, oh, that's where I saw it, yeah. Okay. That's the one. That's it. The beach volleyball player brings the sand up and it falls down at the same time he does. Yeah. Are we, the, the, are we back on the air? The astronaut doesn't. Uh, on, on, on the astronaut one, the sand is falling at Earth gravity, but he's being yanked up by the cable still. Here, yeah. guys. Um, this is, I mean, it's good you're, you're sort of like still talking about this during the break, but um, this may be something we, we want to also bring up when we're recording and when we're doing the show again. Certainly worth doing it. So, uh, so if you don't mind repeating it, because it's, this it's, could be really difficult. This could be really, what's the word, interesting? Well, it's, it's a very good demonstration of how gravity on the moon and gravity on the moon <coughs> are basically the same, unless the astronaut is held up by wires. We, Which they are. Yeah, nice. Okay. okay, how about I share the screen here and uh, and show you that picture you wanted to see? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, let's go. Um, uh, Trevor will have to stop oh, sharing, I guess. Good. How do I do that? Oh, yeah, okay. You got it? Yeah, it's off. Okay, where, uh, where's yours, Scott? Yeah, here's, here's the image you were looking for, right? That's these, right. Are, these are the images of the Apollo 17 okay. and they've taken this image and this image yes and that one and put yeah. the and probably the next one yeah like that and stitch that all together it's like composite no, prints no duplication of rocks down here at all no it's it's the, it's the ones on the bottom and yeah that that's one? down at the bottom along there i don't see any duplication of any rocks in there at all that, that there are three rocks together where you had the number 23 to the right of the number 23 are the three rocks which have been duplicated in this book. In the book. There's the number 23 right there. That's right. Those, those rocks to the right of it, as we look at it, they're the ones that were duplicated, but they're yeah. not duplicated in the original. Not duplicated mm. in the originals? Yeah, which indicates that the picture has been manipulated. And ironically, in that picture as well is the lunar lander. It, it, oh, yeah. It probably was manipulated for the magazine. I mean, they're not, they're oh, just trying to make a pretty looking picture for the magazine. That's all they're trying to do. There's the lunar lander. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. That, it that's, would make sense they made, they make a composite to just make it look better. Oh, sure. Yeah. No, it's, <coughs> I totally agree. This is, it's slightly different to what Neil was talking about last week because what he saw, I mean, that he did protect the lander's next picture. Yeah. All right. But I uh, just want to say that what Neil discovered. Was that we're looking at what looked like a duplicated prop? I mean, the, there was lighting effects were different on the two objects, but it was it looked to me like the same object. Now yeah. that could be. I mean, we talked about this. It could be coincidence, but um, some of the other things Neil discovered, I think, were a lot more significant, like the the pipes. The pipe oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, can I ask how much how, how much longer we're going on this? Um, half another hour. Well, I don't know, mate. I don't know, mate, because I know we because last time I obviously like if you've got to take off somewhere, we'll make sure we time it so that you can get all your stuff in before you have to leave, or maybe we'll end it in t in in due course. But uh, Neil, uh, Neil's our producer, so he, I think it's um, is if he I back yet? Set, if I have to set a hard a hard time, it'd be about um five forty five. Um, I well, I promised a thing for a friend at six o'clock, and um, I didn't know that this. I I didn't think this would go three and a half hours. All right, so, okay, so it's got to go. I mean, last time we finished, we we did about three hours last time. Yeah, um, so, so if we if, yeah if we go another hour and a half. I'm fine. Let's go. Oh, cool. Just, just shout when you have to go. Just mm. that's fine. You know, we might be wrapping up by then anyway. Because by then, I mean, I'll want. I mean, I think most of us want. Most of us in the UK will want to get to bed. Yeah, yeah. Neil, <laughs> you were asking about the. Uh, cameras on the CSM. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have them right them. here. Yeah, that's right. There's there's the camera on the CSM, and yeah. oh, that's right. This this one shows where they're located on here. Uh huh. Actually, this one's a better one of it showing them located on it there. Looks like like, uh, that looks like it's like stripped down for maintenance. Yeah, they never this, covers them, this they? image, this image here on the left hand side is when they're so-called returning from the moon. And 
and they're going to redock with the CSM. Okay, and this is the image that they shot. This is the claim shot. This is a complete error in simulation is what you're looking at here because all of the lens covers are, they're completely covered over. And this is after, all right? None of the lens covers are off. They're all covered over here. That's the location of them. That's the very first thing you're going to see on them. Now, the, the other the other thing is, hey, the only thing, they only did one spacewalk, and there's a picture of the spacewalk of yep. them picking up the panoramic camera magazine. Just one. Right, Scott. Um, sorry to interrupt you, mate. It's quarter past ten. Um, now, what you what you guys have been talking about during the break? Less well, and except when I was away getting my cup of tea, it sounds like uh, we, this could be an interesting part of the show. I mean, do, do do you want to? I mean, who else has a presentation they want to give? Because we can. Oh, I do, but I can chuck it in at any time. It's only ten minutes, my one. Scott yeah. and Marcus, do you want I, what you've been talking about? Point. That's all. Okay, no, but it's sure, Scott. But it'd be good if you could make it like on the air that, rather than uh, the break. I'll just say something quickly. That astronaut has probably got one of the only toilet rolls that's still in existence. So. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, Neil's still recording this. Yeah, I am yeah, still. Yeah, but yeah. We've he great. Can, he can edit this in. Yeah. Oh, right. We we could. I, I thought of a better joke for you. Yeah, I got a fruit. All right. This is a joke you guys can use. If that's one of the only toilet paper rolls in existence, what's it there for? It's there for all the load of bull crap. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. You guys got to do better than that. Uh, You're lying. Probably... We need to make your fake or your hoax or jokes for you. Uh, okay. Fair enough, Luke. You know, I think uh, you, could, you could say it's there because that's the only place you can keep a toilet roll stuck safe without anyone stealing it. Take it to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that's damn sure. Okay, well, here's here's the official table uh, for the panoramic camera, the mapping camera, and the photographic camera that was on the outside of the CSM. Okay? Now, it's official that there was only one spacewalk to pick up the, the magazine. However, they had to go out nine different times because there's nine different magazines for the panoramic camera, they had five more for the mapping camera out there on the outside of this craft. Okay? There's only one recorded spacewalk when they picked it up. The other point being is, is these uh, film cartridges had to be loaded at launch. Okay? They had to go through the atmosphere, the temperature ranges in the atmosphere on the outside of the vehicle, and they had to go through the Van Allen belts on the outside of the vehicle. And was was it pressurized? I mean, Marcus... Absolutely you know, not. Not pressurized, okay. Nothing um, pressurized on the outside of that. We talked only last one about it now. Spacewalk with a full video, they only picked up one magazine and brought it back in. And of course, one, okay. one point to remember about the radiation is that uh, we all talk about the Van Allen belts as if nothing happens beyond them. Uh, the point is that the space is full of radiation beyond the Van Allen belts. Right. So if they're... If they're and there, if there's they're, a different shot, and there's the camera, actual camera shots of them. Okay. They're not pressurized. And mm -hmm. have, we, uh, have we ever seen any photographs taken by those cameras? Okay. And <laughs> there's the magazine that he picked up, was that magazine cartridge right there from the stellar camera? So the cylindrical object was um, was that's, actually, he had, um, that, that's what he picked up, right? Right <laughs> there. So what uh, what were the photographs taken by those cameras? Mm -hmm. Have we? Seen I can't get a hold of any of those images. Would would some of them be of the lunar surface? I seem to recall seeing images of the lunar surface yeah. supposedly taken by Mike Collins or whoever the astronaut was in the capsule at the time yeah, yeah take, i but, can jump in on that that was um they they were mapping are supposedly mapping the lunar surface while at the same time while taking photos of the stars from uh lunar orbit right for future yeah, missions cool. presumably yeah yeah and that's actually documented in um the david there's, w. there's the uh frame numbers of the Here's the frame numbers of the uh, photographs that were taken from the outside. 
And I don't know how you can get the camera mounted vertically or whatever when it's supposed to be in uh, barbecue mode. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I don't know how you do that when you're orbiting. That's um, another little anomaly. But here are the photo here are the photo numbers that are supposed to be taken from that mapping camera. Right. right and there. have you found any of them? No. No, I've I've searched for these on the NASA site. I've Google searched it everywhere else. And from their other adjacent sites, I've looked at uh, mm -hmm. MIT, Harvard, and the University of Indiana. There's a lot oh, of them here. Yes. I mean, there's yeah, 2,000, was it 2,000 something? There's a lot of, of shots were taken. Yeah. But okay. complete anomaly here. Complete error in simulation because well, they maybe, didn't even have the covers taken off of any of the equipment here. Maybe that's why there's no that's pictures because they didn't get, they forgot to take the covers off. You know, we've all done that in the past with old cameras. And yeah. see this little mailbox here? Yeah. They put a little, this thing launched a little tiny satellite out. Oh, yeah, there's, there's three on three of the satellite. missions. Yeah. Okay, and that's where it was located. Okay, now you have to realize that you could not get in the back, in the back side of this part of the sim. Okay, you're confined to the capsule only. So I don't know how any of that equipment worked in there. Mm. <clears throat> but uh, that's yeah. just that's just some more unusual anomalies. Did I was going to say, Scott, did you, whilst you're here, you could maybe show uh, Blue Earth things, some of the stuff that you first showed us, which are uh, like your wet flag and um, the cars on the moon and the, the bat's beer bottle and stuff you like that. You can see them all on the Olive site. Yeah, okay. I, I've, see, I've seen the wet flag before. What, what's your opinion of the wet flag? Um, it's a really bad argument. Uh, I, I don't see... I don't see an issue with the wet flag now. I I know I've seen it before, and I know I I've seen the arguments against it. I can't really think of it right now because it's been a while. Like I that was when I when I found the wet flag argument, that must have been early December, mm -hmm. stuff like that. All I remember is that I saw an argument that demonstrated to me there's no there's no problem there. Um, I would have to go back and find the, and do the research on it again. I can't really just talk on it. I anything. might as well just pull a few images up here. Yeah, go for it. Okay. <clears throat> the only argument I've seen against the wet flag is it's a shadow. Yeah, and I can't see it being a shadow. I looked at it carefully, and you can see the shadows, and then you can see the damp. Yeah. Well, wasn't the flag made of nylon? I mean, would that show wet? Does that look wet to you, uh, Maddox? Let me hold on. Let me. It was made of nylon, wasn't it? The flag. So, oh, the, oh, that the, right the, there, the, the window. Seven, the yeah, seventeen what? was was cloth was. I think it was canvas. One of them. Let's see here. I thought it was made of nylon. One of them was canvas. The other was dried. That like wet? That actually, it looks like dried wet. Now I would have. I have no idea what it would be. Now that that picture didn't have anything on it. Um, but hold on. Stop on one of them for a sec for me, please. Uh, whichever one you think is the best one. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay. No, it, actually, what that looks like to me, it looks like dried water. You know, like like the streaks that water, little streaks of dirt. But the it, water. But it, it's running, right? Huh? <clears throat> it's running. I mean, it's I can't tell if it's actively still running. It looks like it was running, and then it, it was went, running. It dried. Okay. Well, these. Now, well, I mean, that's just for me. I, mean, I could be wrong about these that. These images are supposed to be taken halfway to the moon okay. in zero gravity. Okay. Why is it running? And uh, any moisture would Im immediately outgas. Okay. Uh, there wouldn't uh, be. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there wouldn't be any residue left over. I don't first, know. You, you can pull it up in your own uh, video files if you like. Okay. This is the first time I've seen these three images, so okay. I don't know any history behind them, and I'm taking your y'all's words for everything that's said about it. I'd have to do my own hmm. my own research on it. What, what I would but suggest. My question: What? I would suggest is that anything you can't answer or you're not sure about, you can yeah. certainly go back with what we're giving you and come back another time and say, yeah, I found an answer, you know. Maybe. And, and Maybe. here's here's the outside of the window with the rain guard on it that's broken. Duct okay. tape done. Why would that be on the why would that be on a spacecraft? Why would a rain guard be on the spacecraft? It's got duct tape all over it. Yeah. And I don't know the context of that image. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, and my question would be, 
why would why would those pictures be taken in the first place if it so obviously debunks the the moon the moon landing? There's, there's actually you know, there's several possibilities here, uh, Blue. Now, one of those that these the, it was simply an accident, and the other is that there were certain people who, who were taking these photographs who were actually secretly trying to get the word out. I know um, Mary Bennett and David Percy have talked about this, the whistleblowers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. How about this photograph, just for fun? I'm just pulling them up, just random here for fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. This is supposed to be the Earth, right there. Okay. Yep. Okay. Well, if you're supposed, if you're on the moon, that should be the Earth, right? Mm-hmm. You see the direction the sunlight is hitting the Earth at. Okay. Why is this lit up down here? It's present. They're, they're not even a, this. This isn't. They're not even above the Terminator line. This should be a complete darkness. Okay. Uh, well, obviously the LM is much darker than the Earth. Um, you could tell that because the Earth is extremely bright and the LM is still dark. But the where the sun is, should light be. bounces. They're, they're in total darkness. They're not even above the the sun hasn't come up on the the surface of the moon here yet. I don't see okay. any evidence of them being here's, here's, really here's the antenna pointing straight down. I don't see any so evidence. they can't possibly be communicating with the Earth because this is not lined up with it at all. It's just pointing down. I, I this, I, this can be worked out, can't it? Because the moon has phases when we look up at it now. Yeah. And when you're on the moon and you're looking up, then the Earth would have phases. Which, when and, were they it, on the moon in complete darkness? That's why the book was called Dark Moon. <laughs> Well, the, the, right. well which, which if you look at that, if you look at the angle that the the sun is hitting the Earth at, this okay. is the 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 moon would not be lit up because it's literally on the other I, side I, of I the just, planet. Just yeah. look at the angle that the sun is hitting the the Earth at. You know the camera's tilted, right? Well, he's pointing it straight up, which is a very difficult thing to do when it's trapped on your chest. Yeah. So why is this lit up under here? How come this isn't light lined up? How come they can communicate when this thing's pointing at the ground? Um, because which I, which I don't know about the, I don't know about the the antenna. I'm not going to address that. Light bounces, and a lot of light bounces off the surface of the moon. And I would love to know which do you, do you, uh, just a minute. From bounces around like GFK bullet does, eh? Hey, one at a time, guys. One at a time. Okay. Um, no, are the <laughs> it would be it's be important, I think, to to work out what mission this was when this photo was taken, and it may oh. it may be possible as an anomaly with the phase of the Earth and the, and the lighting effects. I would, but, I I would, I don't see why you would think that this picture was taken while while on the dark side of the moon or while the moon was on. Is dark. Here's the whole Marcus. series. Now, now, Marcus, as we, this is, you said something out of the book being called Dark Moon. That's that's Ben and Percy's book. Um, could you explain a bit more about that, please? Okay, it was called Dark Moon because looking at Apollo 13, if it had landed when it was supposed to land and it hadn't had the oxygen tank explosion and had to return to Earth, if it had landed when it was scheduled to land, it would have landed in darkness. And that can be calculated using Celestron or any of the other uh, lunar programs to show where on a, on the moon at any given time, on a given date, the Terminator will be, if that's what you want to find. And it was uh, several miles beyond the Terminator, so it would have been in darkness, which makes no sense at all, because it would be very hard to land in darkness on the moon Okay. On only the third mission, this is Apollo 13. And then there are so many other anomalies with Apollo 13 uh, that one has to question whether it actually got off low Earth orbit in the first place. Because what was a capsule doing being recovered by the Soviet Navy from the Bay of Biscay the day after Apollo 13 launched? Which does seem a bit strange because. It wasn't supposed to go anywhere near the Bay of Biscay, any launch. But if they, the Russian Navy were on an exercise, they were expecting something to happen. They knew when the launch was going to take place, April the 11th. On April the 12th, which actually is tomorrow, 50 years ago tomorrow, 
Right. On April the 12th, <clears throat> the Russian Navy recovered an Apollo command module from the Bay of Biscay. They put it onto one of their ships, took it back to Mamansk, and handed it back to the Americans six months later. It's now on display at Grand Rapids in Michigan, but it's sealed until 2076. What's it doing being sealed? Um, where's the official Apollo 13 command module? Mm. So the, there is a serious anomaly here. That, was, that, that recovery of the command module was reported in, in the Russian press. It was reported in Stars and Stripes, the American military pub magazine, but that was all. Until somebody started looking into the events that took place, and they were very, very strange and weird events. And what the hell was an Apollo command module doing it floating around in the Atlantic off the coast of France? What's, does, is there an official story in this Russian newspaper that says where this capsule came from? Well, the implication being that it was expected. They were expecting it to land, and they were there to pick it up. Now, whether they did pick it up, or whether the Americans got there first, whether the American submarine got there first to take off the, the astronauts who were on board, because they appeared in the Pacific a few days later, having come down on their parachute. So, as far as the Russians were concerned, they had recovered an American command module, uh, an Apollo command module. <clears throat> but that wasn't reported in America. It was, it was only reported about oh, 30 years later when the story came out. There's, uh, there's, a, there's a major article about it on Apollo uh, on the Owlis website. Oh, it's interesting that the, the actual command module, which is the only part of the, <clears throat> of the entire Saturn V rocket that actually, end, actually returns to Earth, and I know some of them have been accounted for. I know the Apollo 1 capsule is locked up somewhere um, and no one can look at it. But um, where, where... So the Apollo 13 capsule would think would be a special one because this had everyone... This was like the Apollo 13 was probably yeah. the most dramatic mission of all. Exactly. Because it was the only it was the only one where there was a major malfunction, which almost resulted in the death of the astronauts. Yeah. Does anyone know about that? Um, Here's the uh, no, hang on the the Odyssey of the Lost Apollo Command Module. Yeah, I... it's, it's a it's a, a lengthy article, but it covers it in considerable detail. Blue, did you say something? Yeah, I said I found an article on the same thing too on some. Ast a site called Astro Autics. Yes. Uh, it, it was just the first Google research. I just typed in Russia capture Apollo 13. It was just, yeah, um, there it is. I found a little picture. That's not the picture I'm seeing. Let me let me get back to the Skype call so I can see that pic. Hang on, where are we? Here we go. Yeah. That, that's the command module that was recovered by the Soviet Navy before it was okay. handed back. All right. Now, some people have said that that is a boilerplate capsule. But the question still remains, what the hell was it doing in the Bay of Biscay? Because it was never reported missing. Here is it it's being loaded onto the uh, uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutter, the, the South Wind, and it was returned to America. And since, since it was re repatriated and the, the Russians gave it back, does anyone know what happened to it? It's Yes, it's on display at the uh, Grand... Grand Rapids Museum in Michigan. But it's not on display as the Apollo 13 command module. No, it's not. I see, no. There's a picture of it here on display. Um, no, it, it's not labeled as the Apollo 13 um, command module. And I would say, I don't know where the Apollo 13 command module actually is. The Apollo, uh, the, the Apollo 13 command module, that's in Kansas. Okay, here we, here's... That's the one that was recovered by the Soviet Navy. It's called BP Boilerplate 1227. That one right there? Sorry? The, yeah, that one right there, the little white triangle right there? That's the right, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's been sealed. So nobody can look inside it. At the Van Andel Museum Center, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah. Can I ask what was yeah, meant sorry. by... What would be sealed? Sorry, uh, sorry, Blue, to interrupt. I just wanted to ask what was actually meant by boilerplate. Uh, it's a, a, a non-functioning command module. It was used for practice when they would uh, 
uh, astronauts would get on board and it would drop it into the sea and they would practice getting out of it. Okay, right. And the other one, um, what Blue was just saying, is in Kansas, you said. That's the actual, that's the actual command module for Apollo 13. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, here's the article on the same event from the Russian perspective. So you've got two two stories here. This is this is what the Russians say about it. Same same pictures. So we're talking about the same thing. And there's the Soviets. Now that's the South Wind crew with the uh, Apollo command module in the background returning from Murmansk. So it's a weird story. This one. It's a very very weird story. Um, yeah. There are all sorts of pictures, all sorts of accounts of ships appearing at at strange times, as if they were prepared, as if they were preparing to be there for this rendezvous. And the people who crewed these ships are also quite mysterious. This is the Russian submarine, it's a K eight submarine, photographed around. And obviously, you can't tell where it is specifically. Um, I mean, I was about to ask if this had just been one that was lost and then just floated around until someone found it. But obviously the chances, if something that size is lost in the, in the middle of an ocean, the chances of anyone finding it are pretty slim. It might have had a beacon on it, perhaps. But then why, did it, did it have a beacon? Just a possibility, a tracking mm -hmm. beacon that maybe the Russians have picked up. But it was like, it's yeah. possible, but then, you, but then you do have to ask, how come it managed to drift across from... Florida, presumably that's where they were using them, or somewhere off the, the east coast of America, to drift about 2,000 miles across the Atlantic, presumably yeah, it was with the wind, without somebody reporting it missing. Mm. Yeah, and it's, would it has remained afloat for that long in, in the middle of the ocean? It's like when that Russian ship went missing, do you know, it was a cruise liner. It was like a small cruise liner for... for like, I, I wonder no if it's a bit it. of um, the old um, Dunkirk thing where they put a dead body um, washed up on the shore of uh, France, you know, of some mm. guy with, with plans for the invasion of Dunkirk being some other place. I wonder if it's like an American version of that. They they let loose a capsule with all sorts of weird technology that doesn't really exist just to throw the Russians off course a little bit. You know, it's just another it could be yeah. something they would do. <laughs> yeah. It could be. Uh, uh, certainly some reports of it. Just to go back on this map, there's Florida. That's where the Apollo, yep. in this case, Apollo 13 was launched from. There's the Bay of Biscay. So it's a bit off course because here is what is known as the Eye of Africa. It's a, a geological formation about 20 miles across, which is visible from space. It's known as the Eye of Africa because it looks rather like a, an eye, three circular concentric circles. That's, oh, that's that thing uh, in the Sahara Desert, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's in uh, Mauritania, it's about that point there. Uh, and that, as astronauts were launched out of Florida, they would fly across here over Africa, and they would watch out for the eye of Africa so they knew they were roughly on course and got to the right continent. But, of course, this rather um, puts a kibosh on the idea that they avoided the Van Allen belts by launching to the North Pole. Mm. No, they didn't because you can't change direction in a spacecraft. Once you've launched it, you've got to go where it's going. You can't just go into a polar orbit. So, uh, sorry, NASA, you got that, that one a bit wrong. They didn't go over the poles to avoid the Van Allen belts. They went straight through them. There's that some, there's some, yeah, I just want to add one more thing, Marcus. I mean, that's an interesting point you brought up, and I don't like to interrupt you, but um, the, the idea that there's a, a second location where spaceships land, spacecraft come down. Now, the space shuttle was actually launched from the Kennedy Space Center. It landed, I, I believe it landed, at, was it Edwards Air Force Base? Was that where it used to land, which is, yeah. I think, California? But there was actually an emergency landing spot on the other side of the Atlantic. It was actually uh, RAF Woodbridge in Suffolk. That's right. And um, so, where Larry Warren comes used to serve. Yeah. And so where the, where, the, where the alien appeared in 1918, you know, the UFO. But the... the that was just like a bit of, um, what's the word? Is that James Oberg? Oh, yeah, that's James Oberg. Yeah. But the, the, it was just a little bit of, um, it's just, it was kind of anecdote that came up when I was looking into the Rendlesham Forest incident. 
Yeah. That the space shuttle, there was actually an emergency landing spot. The space shuttle, for some reason, had to come down on the opposite side of the Earth and in the other hemisphere. It had somewhere it could land. And I'm kind of wondering, I mean, obviously, maybe uh, maybe Blue or someone knows more about this, or maybe uh, Scott, but was there um, similar plans for the Apollo missions? Um, Easter Island was also one of the emergency landing sites for the uh, space shuttle. Oh, which, nice, yeah. which is why it got opened up as a tourist site because space shuttle never used never landed on um, uh, Easter Island, but a lot of tourists managed to. So presumably, it's got a five mile long runway then, like the uh, Air Force. There, there's yeah. varying uh, documents on uh, the first abort sequence that can happen on a Saturn V rocket. Okay, and you must be in space. Yeah. Okay, they had to do. They had to complete one full orbit uh, yeah. on their on their first. That's their first abort sequence that they could do for a Saturn V rocket. Okay, I, I have the documents on that as well. Okay. So there was. Yeah, they would have. The so that it'd be the quite close to so the launch. They, they wouldn't be in the Atlantic. The first the first one was Hawaii. Hmm. It's a curious thing. I, I don't know quite what to make of this, but it's, it's a very curious coincidence or an um, anomaly associated with Apollo 13. Yes. Right. Well, let's stick with anomaly, shall we? Because there are so many of them, it's going to take a lifetime to work them all out. I didn't realise, incidentally, that this, is the, this was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 13. I mean, that's... I that's think that's most appropriate. Yeah, it must maybe be something that needs to be recognised. Wait, because it is? Is it? Is it? But you said it was. Uh, Marcus mentioned it was the. Yeah. It was April nineteen seventy. Yeah, April the eleventh, nineteen seventy. Today. Yes. Mm. Uh, today. Well, well, fifty years ago today. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're, we're one day after four ten twenty. Anybody recognise that number? Those numbers. Four ten twenty. Was that when the explosion happened? No. If you take each number, four is D. J is uh, ten is J. And twenty is T. You get DJT, Donald Trump. It's his birth. <laughs> <laughs> That's like something from Robert Anton Wilson. <laughs> yeah. I the eleventh photo. You see, we, we talk about the moon, and then we start to get trivia. <laughs> yeah. I was just wondering, like about about Apollo thirteen, because um, of course, as I said, this is this is probably the most exciting mission for the wrong reasons. I mean, what well, perhaps Apollo eleven, <clears> but. Because there was a major malfunction, because everyone was for a few for a few days, everyone was really scared that those guys would never get back home. Um, so, if if everything else was fake, then presumably this was faked as well. Sorry, I mean, no. why why would someone fake a space disaster? Was it because they? Uh, I can't remember who I heard this from. Now is so that they'd already preset the time that it was going to land and someone had spotted something about the fact that, oh my God, that's on the dark side of the moon. How are we going to get out of this one? So the whole idea of having an explosion in space was a get out kind of clause. Yeah, that was the, um, that's what I wrote in my book. And I didn't Maybe say I read it in yours. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, I'm not saying that that's the reason. I'm just saying that that was a possible scenario that, uh, you know, that could explain why they come up with that. I mean, I threw that in there just to get the reader to think and to research that there's many other possible reasons. But there's one point that I want to bring out, and Marcus was talking about the Apollo 13 uh, landing on the dark side of the Terminator. Um, the counter argument to that is, well, no, they would have landed slightly on the sunlit side of the Terminator. But if that's true, and, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this in depth in my second book, but um, there, keep in mind, the official versions has Neil Armstrong and the Apollo commanders of all the six missions doing a visual landing. We're not talking an instrument landing here. We're talking visual. Yeah. And in order to have an instrument landing, you need a comparable amount of equipment on the ground as you have in your aircraft. The two have to be in sync. They have to be working in tandem. So if this was a visual landing, and if this, even the argument about, well, they were slightly on the sunlit side of the Terminator still doesn't hold any water for the simple reason, if you're on a visual landing and you're landing in very unfamiliar terrain, um, you've got shadows 
elongated shadows, more different shadows to deal with, that would have to be factored into uh, the lunar module simulations. And I haven't found any evidence that that was factored in yet anyway. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So either argument, um, either argument doesn't hold water for NASA. Trevor, um, you've been quite quiet. Do you want, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, no, I'm just interested, actually. In what's, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of new things for me. Uh, no, I'd, I'll make a presentation next uh, session, I think. Is the, Trevor, I just want to say I read your book. I read your first book. I finished it, and I quite enjoyed it. I have your second book I'm going to start soon. But uh, if it's anything like the first book, I'm sure I'll enjoy that too. Yeah, I mean, the, the first book was basically impartial. I, I actually believe they went to the moon. <laughs> yeah, I picked up on that. Uh, you <laughs> picked up on that. that did the second book but uh, you still brought up you know it was a good counterpoint in in the uh, first book and i thought it was well done yeah i mean the only thing there was the chapter 19 you know the smoke and mirrors videos i couldn't find any uh, uh pro nasa people who commented on that yeah uh, I, I don't think any pro nasa people have commented on it because i don't think they're even aware of it i've not seen any comments well, Blue is your okay. chance. Have you heard of this? I have not. Oh, uh, some homework for you, Blue. <laughs> I, I think I think NASA has commented on it. They've been pulling it down from everywhere off the internet. Oh, ah, that is a type of comment, isn't it's, it? It's still on my site. Right, it goes with the book, so you can still see it on my site. Yeah, now that's it's it's good that you've archived it there. Well, I've archived it everywhere. <laughs> things to look at on there yeah, yeah. Uh, there was one point Marcus that uh, you were discussing with Blue on, on, on that last session you had yeah about the lunar landing sites the coordinates yeah yeah um, and if you remember there were many different versions I mean for Apollo 11 and these are all NASA figures, yeah. all NASA documents that give many different versions. And on Apollo 11, uh, one pair is 20 kilometers apart. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've still got that. Uh, but what I did find from that is that a lot of those original documents have now been deleted. Yes. Yes, yeah, so I've been trying to archive as many as possible. Yeah, me too. And, but I, I didn't I do have, and and then I compare them with the updated files that they're putting out. I unfortunately I didn't do. I right. mean, that's interesting. I'm just going to share my screen now for the. Uh, I'll just find it. Those are the different coordinates for 11, 12, 14, 15. And if you look at the bottom, the source of all these... Haven't got it yet. Haven't you got it yet? It's up on the I screen. can see it. Can I you? can see it. I, can I see thought it. it was a blue screen of death for a minute. Yeah, I've got <laughs> it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it, <laughs> there it is. If you look at the sources for all these coordinates, these are all NASA. All NASA. Yeah. But very different versions. Some of them are... I mean, these two are 20 kilometres apart. Yeah, I don't know how they explain this. I mean, it was a business about um, whether the retro ref re reflectors could be pinpointed. And the point is, these are just so desperately different that I don't see how it's possible. Well, they must be quite close to the actual basis, you know, where they where they landed. We can see the figures. I mean, mm. this uh, 2343, 2363, that's 20 kilometres apart. Because they didn't have the, it was only seventy five feet from the craft. They didn't have like the rover for the first. Is it the first three missions or four missions? Three, so could, three, okay. yeah, fifteen, yeah. Mm. They, so they couldn't have got very far. They only they only had to move on foot. That's um. The, 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 those are the coordinates of the <laughs> of the LEM of the lunar module. Mm. I wonder if I could ask something, because this was actually during the break. I mean, I hope Neil can edit this, this in, because obviously during the break, you guys were, stay, were still here and having a really, really interesting discussion. Um, but I think it was Marcus was showing this. It looked like someone playing basketball. Um, about the gravity. 
Lunar gravity. Yeah, I was I was out getting a cup of tea, but Marcus, yeah. you were showing you were showing this, weren't you? What's that was all it, about? Was that, it Trevor's advert? It was it, it was Trevor who was showing it. Uh, what I was describing was the. It was the trailer for the second book. That's right. It was uh, comparing a beach volleyball player here on Earth, and as he jumps up, you see the sand coming up with him, and as as he goes down, the sand goes down as well. And Trevor compared that image to the jump salute where the astronaut <laughs> jumps up and the sand also j goes up, but then the sand goes back down again and the astronaut's still up in the air. Because oh, you, can't put, you can't put sand on bits of string and make and suspend them in the air as you can a, uh, yeah. an astronaut. I mean, and what's happening there is the sand falls at Earth gravity or near enough in actual fact there's some slow motion added but the astronauts being still pulled up that's with, right with a wire i mean that's the, yeah. this is based on like um the acceleration in the gravitational field and things like that um which yeah, is it, which is a fixed rate for all objects unless there's some kind of um airflow time of resistance like a parachute like the feather and, and things like that oh right I, mean, I can make a presentation next one about this gravity business right you are right that now. for me is the it, is the killer for the not going to the moon. Right, yeah. no, we'll do that. Uh, Neil, in the meantime, Neil, you've got a presentation, I believe, you yeah. want to, to bring uh, up. Has so everyone well. finished their presentations? I don't want to cut people off from their does, does we, does screen we shares or anything. Because we, uh, Randy had his. and <clears throat> Scott, we'll, did you want to show any more? or Have you got one, Scott? No, I'll keep it for the next. We're running late. so. No, no that's fine. You go okay. ahead, Neil. Right, go ahead, Mike. Okay, so if I go for uh, screen share, the Apollo 14 mission. How could the sand have compacted itself enough to appear like mud in a moistureless environment? There is also another detail worth mentioning. These metal plates have a series of letters and numbers engraved on their surface. Subsequently, these letters and numbers have filled up with sand. But how can the sand preserve the shape of the number once dislodged from the original place where it was formed? Here, for example, we can see the number five, which has kept its shape even after being dislodged from the engraving. And here is the number three, also keeping its shape after it was dislodged. How can the sand keep the original shape after having been dislodged from the engraving if we are truly in a moistureless environment? Just look at how solid and squared the little bars of sand that have formed under the astronaut's boot are. They are almost perfect geometric solids with sharp edges and well-defined contours. These sandbars are so solid and compacted that they even retain their shape after they are broken in pieces. It's as if we were looking at a clay model that is later dried up in the sun. It is clear that we are looking at a very different result from the one obtained by the Mythbusters in the vacuum chamber. If we were to break apart or even just try to move one of these sandbars, they would certainly not remain compacted, nor would they retain their shape. In conclusion, the Mythbusters, with their experiment, have proven the exact opposite of what they intended to prove. In absence of humidity, it's absolutely impossible to replicate the astronauts' footprints. If it's true, like many believe, that the Apollo missions were filmed in a studio on Earth, one of the biggest problems would have been to simulate the lunar gravity, which is about... Oh, bear in mind as well, like Earth. one tear in that spacesuit, the most just one tiny tear. Mm. Such an effect mm. has always been no, no. the use of steel wires. And it would de yeah, depressurize. Extremely thin and invisible and that to camera. Okay, can you counter that argument? Yes, I can. The, the spacesuit had many, many layers. It wasn't thin. 
it was thick for a reason. How many layers did it have? I think, oh crap, I can't know off the top of my head, but it had somewhere... At 17, I think it was. Yeah, it was, it was a lot. Yeah. Anywhere between 11 and 21, depending on what file you're looking at. Yeah, basically. But presumably, they were very thin layers. I mean, they, you, you couldn't have 17 layers of... You know, you could wear 17 t-shirts, for instance. <laughs> well, they weren't t-shirts. So some of them were just straight straight armor, for the most part. Uh, let me see if I can find a file that has all the layers on it. Is simulated. There is a problem, however, with steel wires. While they are normally invisible to the camera, they may get hit by the light at a particular angle, making them momentarily visible on the screen. And this is exactly what seems to have happened in the sequence from Apollo 14. While the astronauts are busy near the limb, at one point some flashes of light can be seen above the head of one of them. The initial flash is certainly caused by the antenna mounted on the backpack. This antenna, which is about one foot long, often reflects the light that hits it. But then there is a second flash, right above the first one, which cannot be attributed to the antenna, and looks exactly like one caused by a steel wire. Let's watch again in slow motion. This is the contour of the astronaut with the backpack on his shoulders. This is the antenna causing the first flash of light. And this is the second flash of light, definitely above the first one, which cannot be ascribed to the antenna. There is something else reflecting the light, some three feet above the astronaut's head. And this something cannot be a flare in the lens from the first flash, because the second flash occurs after the first one and not simultaneously. A similar case occurs during the Apollo 17 mission. Here, too, we see a double flash of light from the antenna, and then another flash, much higher, right above the astronaut's head. In this case, this cannot be a flare inside the lens either, because the flash above occurs after the ones below, and not simultaneously. There is something else reflecting the light, a few feet above the astronaut's head, in a space that should be totally void of objects of any kind. Anybody who owns the original videos can verify Important that to know the, the guy that made this film was uh, an expert in photography, and he also makes his own films as well, so he knows about things like lens flare and uh, film artifacts and things like that. aren't the only thing suggesting that steel wires were yeah. used in the scenes from the moon. There are also several instances in which the astronauts seem to be rising from the ground with no effort whatsoever, as if some invisible force were pulling them up. Let's analyze some of these Now there's a point coming up here, which makes me question, why did they make a ladder come in from the lane? No if it's so easy it's for one of the astronauts to pull himself up the him up back side the of the lane using his arms, here, you'll see this in a second, which I, I was absolutely astounded to see. While rotating on yeah. himself. You'll see this Let's in a second. Here, the astronaut is first pulled up and then seems to remain floating in midair. That looks like wise, looks like definitely. A puppet hanging from some invisible string. Especially the weight of that backpack, you would Here, fall back. Here, the fallen astronaut gets up from the ground you can as if a mysterious sensor, you know. force were pulling him up. Yeah, look at that. Look, whoa, backpack. he's pulling up on wires. Let's watch it again. Look, and he's close. touching his helmet. He's not even. Yeah, that, that's really getting pulled up. You can't do that. Here, the astronaut is working with some weird. tools when suddenly mm. a of mysterious it, force. Of course, it looks weird, and they're in a pressurized right. suit on a different on, on the moon. Let's watch it again. Okay, I expect well, it to look weird. We'll watch this sequence coming up on the lunar module in a second. There is even a situation where the astronaut complains that he cannot get up, and he almost seems to wait for someone or something to pull him up. But I can't get up. The astronaut waits until a mysterious it's, force. It's interesting, he can't get up there, but. <laughs> In this he, case, the, the not the same astronaut, but he pulls himself up literally the side of the back side of the lunar module. In fact, if we and I don't know how much these suits we weigh, and I know supposedly one sixth of the gravity. But it makes you question, well, why did they bother up. putting a ladder there? If it look, here, this is the sequence. Watch this guy. The astronaut on the left takes a leap forward and then remains floating in midair. His legs dangling Ding. while a strange force pulls him up. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. I mean, what sort of strength would you need to do that? You don't need a lunar module it ladder, looks like do you? It again, he looks like motion. he's on a ladder. Well, yeah, but that's watch actually... His feet. The... Watch his feet. 
Yeah, but he's, he's, he's actually, yeah, but he's and swinging finally, from side to side. The There's no lag there, because that's the back side. Yeah. Look at the that's movement. The astronaut things. manages that's the back to make side of the lunar both module. his legs, first forward, then backwards, without <coughs> leaning on anything. It's as if his feet with the slide, but forward. Just play that back again. That is the ladder. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just look at the mess at the top with the, the see? Yeah. See up above? That is the ladder. Oh yeah, I can see his it. Now. Yeah, right. on it, just his one arm. He's swinging he's back, on, he's swinging back and forth on the swinging. on the wire. Let's watch it again in slow motion. At one point, he doesn't even have any hands on. Seems yeah. to be moving by itself. At first, we cannot tell whether it was the astronaut who touched it. But then we see that while the astronaut is brushing the dust away, the thermal cover floats by itself more than once, as if a soft breeze were lifting it from below. There is also another curious case, again during the Apollo 16 mission. When one of the astronauts closes this flap on the rover, we notice a puff of dust being blown upwards. Let's watch it again in slow motion. Some may suggest it could have been a vibration to move the sand. But in reality, the entire now, this rover is, is interesting. covered by sand. If there was a vibration, all the sand would move at once. Here instead, the sand is blown upwards in one specific spot only, and exactly next to the flap being closed. we see that while the astronaut is brushing the dust away, the thermal cover floats... Okay, so how... how I'll just get rid of this. So uh, there we go. Get rid of that. I shall stop sharing my screen now. If I can. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that, Neil. That was interesting. Okay. Story. That was a pretty cool video. Uh, that is something I'll definitely have to check out, and I would, I'd love to. I've been wanting to do a series on documentaries. Now, um, material for your channel there. Uh, of what? It is. <laughs> um. Can you still see my mouse? Because I'm not convinced yeah, I've stopped. It's the mouse, yeah. Right, yeah. so I've got to stop sharing the screen. So bear with me. Stop sharing. There we go. So now it should revert to that's you can't it. see my mouse. That's cool. Okay. So the flap there was the thing that I was curious about. But the flap where you got an astronaut dusting something like a solar panel or something on some contraption. And then he moves away. And this flap to the right of it, like a gold flap sort of moves up and down a few times as if it's suggesting that like a breeze or something is blown on there um any any thoughts on that blue uh my first thought is that that could easily just be the astronaut hitting it to where the astronaut's moving right out of frame that is very zoomed in and we can e we can barely even tell what's happening mm. so i i wouldn't see how that could be used as evidence to show that there could be wind or anything like that now possibly yeah there could be wind on that one bit but what I'm saying is I don't see how that can be conclusive anyway. <clears throat> Possibly wind on that one bit, you mean? Well, yeah, like if the moon landing was fake, then that could be wind. But I don't see how that single clip can be conclusive either way, seeing that it's so zoomed in and it's so low poly, to be honest. Okay. Scott, Scott have you got the images of the oil on the, uh, the lunar rover and kind of dust stuck to the oil with the wheel rim? I probably can pull that up. That would be Just give My me a second. Is, I would love to know how everybody thinks that the moon landing, the, the video was faked. I would love to know how everybody thinks the moon, the, all that. It's what set. <laughs> was in like how in terms of the mechanism of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like how in terms of the mechanism. I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. It's just, I just want to. Well, just, simple. Okay. just read the Finney file. It's also, it's something we've. Um, 643 yeah. pages long there. Which it's, file? Uh, Finney file. Finney file. It's the complete documentation of all of the uh, all, it's all the practice training, everybody that's involved, the locations they were at, how they did the geological, everything right through. It's it's something we've addressed. Well, we've addressed it several times over the course of this, this series of programs. Um, for example, uh, Mark is talking about the lighting effects, and um, other and Scott talking about the. the the pressure, air pressure, and things like that, and several other people. There's, it's, it's several different uh, areas of research that has led to explain how this could have been done in studio conditions. Okay. 
But um, obviously, there's a lot here. There's no sound bite answers, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Lot of material. Yeah, I can share it's the screen. On... And I imagine everybody on this call has a different uh, point of view on it. There's not one single thing that you guys have all figured out. Um, of course, well, we, we, we all have different like opinions yeah. on things. Yeah, of course. I mean, I was just wondering, like going through all you guys, is is it wires? Is it slow down footage? Is it miniatures? Mix of all of them? What is it? Uh, like, I think all of it. they used all of it for sure. Okay. Funny enough, the miniatures things was there's something that was new to me, but this was brought up on the last program, um, and that was interesting. That there were some miniatures used. I mean, this is what um, I think Marcus was talking about this, but yeah, um, yeah Marcus mentioned yeah. miniatures on when me and Helm were on Dead Kennedy's show. <clears throat> Scott, explain what's going on here. Well, what you see here is oil leaking from down here. You can see it very, very wet down here. I have no idea why they cleaned off the stripe on this spot. It's perfectly clean. You can see everything sticking here, here, and here, and you can see it spraying up the inside. Mm -hmm. And the dirt sticking to it there is completely covered there and there. There's other shots of the, of the astronauts, uh, and the back of their uh, suits are covered with the oil as well. Could there be an argument that it could be static that's holding the dust to the metal? No, it looks quite different. This is the only wheel where it's wet. Where is that? What do you reckon? Okay, this is the left rear wheel. And this, this particular um, rover is used on all three missions because it still has the same leaky oil wheel. I, don't, I, I still don't see where the oil is. Ah, uh, sorry, sorry, you can't see it. Is this is that the black material that seems to be spattered onto the hub? Yeah, well, it here's looks like lubrication here's, here's oil. Here's where you see the difference. Does that not it's just be lunar dust. But then, how's it sticking? Because it's... the lunar dust is very sticky. I mean, mm -hmm. you get how is it sticking to the astronaut? How's it sticking to literally everything else? Wasn't that one of the biggest problems they found? But you can see the difference in the wheel from the front to the back. This is oil leaking out of the rear axle on here. I showed you the other picture. It's spraying up. It's very it's patchy, spraying, isn't it? It's spraying up together. Spraying right up there, right up the frame there. So where's the oil coming from that's spraying out of the axle? Right out of the center of the hub. There, it, you never axles, driven a car axles, before? Yeah, axles are filled with grease, not with the oil. Right. Well, that's where it's spraying up. No, 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 no. Axles up are filled there. with grease. It's, it's coming out of here. You can see where it's coming out of. Our, you no, can see where it's very wet and sticking all around. It's if, not like um, other dirt. If it was lunar dust, for instance, you would get it over the central hub cap bit in the middle, but it's actually coming out from under it. If you go back to that wheel again, Scott, uh, yeah. like you say, yeah. See, see if you see, uh, see where you got the little bolts around the central cap in the middle. There's there. nothing there gooey. at all, but it's coming out from under it. It's not dry. It's gooey. Yeah, it, okay. it looks like wet mud. And, and this is a very distinctive mark on it here, where it's spraying up. It, it, you, know, you know, when I first found this, okay, I sent this. Not... I I emailed this to a couple of mechanics, and I said, "How much?" Like, what's the problem? How much? Okay. And it was between $250 and $400 to fix my uh, vehicle. That's what they did. I didn't, they didn't even recognize it as the rover. They just thought it was a dune buggy. <laughs> yeah. they, Scott, thought it was, they thought it was an old Volkswagen. Scott, where's the oil coming from if it's oil? From the rear axle seal. Right there. That so is an axle seal right there. Axle. You've never worked on a car, obviously. Grease is in the axle. Axle grease. Really? Yes. Really? Oil is in and the what's engine. behind that? Huh? So you're telling me that the oil came out of the transmission? Not out of a transmission, no. Can you please demonstrate to me where the oil's in the axle? It's, it's I, I, inside as far as the I'm aware, of the axle. Don't not, forget, on the other side of this is an electric motor. Okay? Why and is it has oil gear, electric? and it has, it'll probably be using 90-weight motor uh, gear oil in there. Not straight grease. 
not bearing grease. Oil oil will usually go in the transmission. Same, same oil you put in a differential. But can I ask about this actually? Because there, the, presumably there are plans for the lunar rover. I mean, they, no, they're it's they're been designed. Now. They've gone along with the rockets, okay. But um, it would need some kind of lubrication oil. Obviously, it's an electrically powered vehicle, but it would need some kind of grease or oil, which yeah, is put on yeah, um, yeah, all surface, the, the, yeah, the moving the parts oil, within the axle. Yeah. You mentioned the differential. It's got a few moving parts. There's possibly, like, suspension, the springs and things like that. I mean, I've, uh, have you ever seen anything like this on a normal car? I mean, Scott, did you say you've seen this effect before? on like a, a dune buggy you mentioned your mechanic said it was a dune buggy yeah well, does that actually happen on a normal car on an earth oh, car absolutely just mm -hmm. drive a dodge pickup truck the rear axle seals leak and it all leak like that's lubricated right through inside the casing right through from the differential out to the outside then there's a seal and then you have grease for your your bearing seals but when that breaks through it just leaks out everywhere I mean, is there any other? If you're pictures? on the lunar surface and it's liquid, it will evaporate. Is there any other pictures from that same mission where the wheel is clean, as if some some mechanic spotted that no, and said, "Cut, them. guys, we've got to cut everywhere. this. Yeah, let's get in here and let's clean this up before we carry but on." That, but the thing is, that's Apollo 17, and the same wheel is apparent in Apollo 16 and in Apollo 15 as well. Can, that's the whole right. point. It's the same rover being used over and over again. And now I'm going to pull a file up. I'm going to pull a file up. Say, what, you, what did you say, Blue? Is it, is it possible that it's just because that the lunar dust is either. very sticky? One sec, Scott. Is it very is it possible that lunar dust is very sticky and that's lunar and that's just the lunar dirt on the hub? And well, why only that wheel then? Slash oil or whatever. Why on only that water? wheel? What? What do you mean why, why only that, that wheel? Has two. But they're not the same. It's not anywhere near the same. They're not the same. I drive my car through the dirt all the time, and it's not the same on, on the front or the back. Right. Why? But the other side on the other side on the back is I not, can't see the other side on the back. It's not like that. I can't see the other side on the back. Well, then you better take a look at the photographs and study In them. The photograph, we can't instead see of, the instead of telling me you can't see it, then take a look. I can't. I don't, because don't, it does it, you can't see both no, sides. You need to take I don't look. think it's possible to resolve this actually because um, I mean we don't I mean it's possible we can't actually feel the substance. It's, it's just an image of what of some kind of substance. We can't actually feel yeah. it. We can't actually see it. Well, we, we can we see need, it. We, see we need Darren from. really because I think he's got the geo geological <laughs> geological um, know how. He's going to he's gonna be back in May, but I don't think we yeah. can resolve this right now, guys. But so it's an interesting thing that's got spotted, and um, it's certainly and one of the. I think it's certainly one of the things that needs investigating, if possible. What's the other thing he's going to bring up? Bring up there, Scott. Another <laughs> shot or something. I was just going to pull up uh, another little. Um, I'll just find it here in a second. Do we? Does anyone know what might be the sticky residue on moon dust? Let's say it was sticky. What what would cause that to be sticky? I would have thought some kind of moisture or liquid or something. But then, the as Marcus thin, would say, it should out gas. Very thin oil, according to the smoke and mirrors. A very small amount of thin oil to stop the uh, the the um, sand forming dust clouds. I so remember that. Yes, that's what gets yeah. on the suits and everything. But, and, the, mean, and the NASA position, sorry to interrupt, Ben, and the NASA position is that they're fine molecules of grain that are like, almost like uh, claws on each other and they cling to each other yeah. and that's why they clump together. That's the NASA argument, I believe. I've heard it said also that because of cosmic rays, there's a lot of static charge in it, which you get static cling. But it's... I mean, I've also seen, though, in other shots, you see that the, it flowing quite easily and, and and smoothly as if it's not stuck together, like uh, almost like it's sand in some of the other shots. So uh, Apollo 16 is quite mm. dry. Mm. So, so there's, um, again, I mean, it's it's these are things that's worth investigating, but I'm not sure it's possible to resolve them from visual evidence alone. With, with the static cling argument, okay, then when it landed, why is there no static cling on any of the, the landers? Yeah, it's on the just pad, on the landing. Yeah, yeah there's nothing the pad, on the yeah. landing. The landing pads, even though they're like a concave upwards facing surface, there's no dust at all on those landing pads. That's, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I think right. there should be, shouldn't there? Surely. Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Another um, another point to to just um, add to that. Um, one of the uh, things that kept coming up with the lunar module, and this is when it was being built, designed, and built, manufactured, that they went through great lengths to make sure that the whole entire room and building, rather, was sterilized, uh, including the uh, suits that the um, technicians themselves are wearing when they're working inside and around the lunar module. Now, I'm assuming that the argument would be that the um, lunar module inside the controls, the dials would have been sealed, but still, they didn't seem to be too concerned about fucking dust all over the place and floating around inside the learner module, which could kind of have the potential to interfere with the uh, fly-by-wire system. So that's just something that I'm looking into right now. Well, I always remember when I was at school. Okay, I mean, here's, the other, here's the other one that I was going to show you on here, this particular image here. This is, this is from their uh, training schedule. Okay, and this is from Apollo 15. And this is the equipment that they were using while they were training, just while they were practicing. So they actually had had uh, four cameras with four mounts for the front of their um, suits on it. These are the cameras, collection bags, and stuff like that. And you come down here, and they actually have four PLSS mock-ups. They're not the real thing. They're just to practice with. Okay? Show us, and show you us Scott have to realize it. that when they're practicing here on Earth, mm -hmm. you can't have a super heavy suit. You cannot have a 180-pound suit on an astronaut, okay, when he's practicing on Earth. Like flat, this is from uh, located at Flagstaff where they were doing this practice, and it was chosen over top of any of the other locations um because of it, it's at seven thousand feet and it's a much cooler environment and they're they're going to be overheated in the suits when they're doing a full simulation so they actually made a suit that was much lighter the the pls mock-ups the basically all they had in them was a couple of cooling fans and and uh, a little battery and the radio set with their antenna that's all they had in them to lighten them up. They had extra batteries, they had extra, and they always had two rover type vehicles on every set when they were using it. And that's what I'm showing the multiple rover tracks. Okay? Because the same thing that they they were doing in their practice were the actual final simulations. Okay? They never the pictures. Anywhere. I think we've got Marcus's um, screen. Yeah. Being I haven't seen any of that. Sorry about that. <clears throat> It, it, it's just that I can't see uh, what Scott is sharing at the moment. Yeah, yeah I, can't neither can we. I, I think it's uh, behind think... our uh, images there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Can you see it now? No. I th I think Marcus's screen is being oh, shared. Okay. Oh, there we go. I can see How something. How about that? Right. There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, that's the original list, yeah. Okay, but this yeah. is what the this is what they took out when they were... Were when they were just training, but this is exactly what you see in a final simulation. Okay, the four PLS mock-ups are right there, right? They're not the real thing. Mm. All of all of the experimental equipment were just mock-ups to practice with. They they weren't functional pieces of equipment. Okay, and right down at the bottom, they always had two rovers with. Them, right, mm. just while they were doing the practice. That's exactly what you see in the final simulation in the actual photographs for that they claim are the final simulations are just shots from when they were practicing. Mm -hmm. Are there yeah. two rovers, um, Scott? I mean, like, you, you mentioned they reuse rovers. Are there two rovers in each simulation? I mean, like, in the final, what we... Think they were only simulation. supposed to have one with them. Yeah, and there was one permission. But you yeah. can see multiple, and the, the, they were hand-built machines, so even the tracks are different. Okay. And if you watch any of my videos, you'll see that there are multiple rovers in there. Even the frames are built differently. Okay. Okay. But they also had four PLSs, mock-ups. Okay. They're just, they're just uh, covered over pieces of aluminum to uh, do it. They, they couldn't possibly. There's absolutely no possible way you're going to run around 
with 180 pounds of equipment on just to practice it, not in Earth's gravity. <laughs> Excuse me. They wouldn't be able to bend over. That that uh, pack alone is well over 100 pounds. You wouldn't be able to bend over and pick anything else up, right? The entire stuff weighs as much as them. And if you read the Finney file, which I keep saying that you got to read the Finney file, it's, it is an extensive thing on the training. It shows where they went to, where they went for the geological rock locations from Antarctic. It's the, they're in Nevada. Um, Arizona, uh, California. There's even a cinder lake in California. So the cinder so the called actual... the schooner cone, and and it even tells it gives you the date, the time, the number of people that were there, the purpose that they were going uh, to that location for. It has like all the dates, times, everything are in that file. So the final result. Of what you're talking about the what we call the apollo visual record was actually done on these very missions so it was created on these missions those were their training missions mm -hmm. okay and it even shows how they selected flagstaff as the final location and it's because it had the right type of soil houston wanted it they couldn't get it it was far too warm there they didn't have the right location or the right soil conditions to do the simulations so when Flagstaff was chosen, they did the they blasted out the craters and, and did the moonscape there. They also built Hadley Ridge there, Hadley Rill, on that location to practice with. So All these things exactly are there. They the, shot it outside. Exactly what you see in the photographs. So they shot it outside. They shot it an outdoor set at night. You must be at night time if they were shooting outdoors. If they're, it was shot outside, they're shooting out. Door for a All good right. portion of it. Okay. They had they had indoor simulations for uh, lunar orbit, lunar landings. Yeah. All of those things were done on the other simulators. All of that equipment was there. And these how, they had, they had a hundred and twenty foot high <clears throat> gantry crane, three hundred feet by six hundred feet yeah. long, to simulate the landings, and you can even see the videos on that. All right. How do you uh, how do you account for the inverse law or inverse square? What are you talking about? You you're you're talking about communications square. now. What how is do that? You, uh, the inverse square law? How do you account for that? Is this the gravity? Is this with gravity? No, this is not gravity. This is lighting. That if something is four if something is twice as far away, it's four times dimmer. Because yeah, they're using miniature sets. No, they're using outdoor sets. Doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It absolutely matters. Go to Daytona. <laughs> what do you mean? Go, yeah, there's many, many lights. If you look at the ground at Daytona, exactly. There's a there you shadows. go. Jeez. There's a How bunch of shadows. That out? They can light it up. No, you know, they, they, they ran can't. and watched them light what? up the entire they can't. city. Hey, one at a time, guys. One at a time. Hey, one at a like, time. They You're in for a square you law. Just You're Maddox. To, uh, oh my go God. Get an dude. education. <laughs> Read the stuff. Have you read the Finney file? <laughs> Have you was... read any of it? None of it. <laughs> I haven't even watched my videos. Oh my god! We're talking here about like a uh, little child. Hey. I'm gonna tell you that to your face, Scott. You know none nothing. of that, please. Yes. Come on, he's come on. None of that. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting. He's, no, he's, he's making a point. Cast. He's making a good point, right? It's 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 what if if this was artificial lighting? It's a valid question. Exactly. What, well, this we were tight. talking now, about artificial lighting. We were talking about those sets. Because yes. Marcus and where Marcus, they were located. So. If he wants to talk about lighting, he can read about it. Because like Why? Marcus talks, Marcus brought this up in detail, like because he talks about like there was fill in lights. I think Marcus is Marcus is frozen, I think. You, Marcus, you're right. Oh, you're okay. Oh, because yeah. if if there was like one single light, then maybe what Blue said is valid but maybe maybe there was more than one night maybe it was a large spotlight like at a race like a motor racing circuit like you said okay. or maybe there were right like, reflector boards i mean marcus maybe you can, can bring I that can i yeah can I, of course what you just said all right so the reason why we we pretty much know it can't be one single light is because they don't make lights big enough that can go as far out as we see in the thing or we see in the pictures we we see the sets go on very far, ex like extremely far, um, hundreds of meters. 
in the back. And now you can say that's a miniature. Okay, then that's a, then that can be a miniature. Or if there could be a backdrop, okay, there could be a backdrop. Please demonstrate how there's a backdrop. But if there's a one single light, then there has to be a drop off in that light. I in realistic. There's a reason. Here we go. I, it, uh, okay, Scott, Scott, screen, we Scott, okay. Scott, 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 Scott. All right, thank you. Just when watch. you when you shoot Scott, hey, wait a sec, Scott. Just you'll, you'll come back in yeah. a minute. Don't worry about it. You'll come back in a minute. Go on, Blue. When you shoot movies, the whole reason why you shoot a movie outdoors for many scenes that you could shoot in a studio is because you have the one giant light. Nothing can beat that light, and that's the sun. That's one of the first things they teach you when you film anything. You can't beat the light of the sun because the sun lights everything up pretty darn evenly. That's why you want to shoot on an overcast, by the way, if you want a little film tip there. Always shoot an overcast. But um, when you shoot in a studio, you rarely or rarely will you ever use a single light to light something up. And that's because you can't light everything with a single light in a studio. You have to have multiple lights because none of them are powerful enough to simulate the sun. Now, they can for a very small scene, for like a very small set, but if you want to take the entire studio set, you have to use a bunch of things. And that's why in movies, you rarely see the ground. In movies, you see a lot of stuff up. You don't really see the ground much. And if you do see the ground, then that's because there's a separate light that is behind the actors shooting on the ground. Do you do? I mean, in some movies you do, though, Blue. I mean, like in in Stanley Kubrick's two thousand and one, you see you see like a location which is which is a studio set of the moon, which is actually not unlike what you see in Apollo. No, it's very um, it's very unlike. Uh, if you actually look at the difference between the two, they don't they don't look anything similar. It, this two thousand and one Space Odyssey's moon set is not very good, to be honest. It, okay. you know, it looks good on film, but it's nowhere near realistic. Okay, Scott, you have a reply for this? Just look at the photographs. Look at the fallout. Look at the hot spots. What do you mean? Look, Just all right, look at see. these AI photographs. Okay, hold on. Let, let, don't, that, I, I don't need to discuss one. it. Take you one. sit there and tell one. me all of this stuff. Yeah, look at one. the fallout. So the, 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 the lighting effect you see here, Scott, is is what? I mean, is this is this you can see here that this is studio lights? <coughs> what you're saying? I mean, I've discussed this with hey, Robert. Hey, uh, I don't know how many times, okay? And that's Scott. what he did for a living. Please, outdoor, take any outdoor scenes. One sec, Blue. One sec. Sorry, sorry. Okay, so this is like um, you, you, you. Where is the so the lighting effect's not even over this landscape? Is that is that what you're saying, Scott? If that's sunlight, then it would be even. And he just said that himself. I'm just showing you the photographs just in these large bitmaps, and you can see the fallout. Look at the fallout. Look at the hot spots. Okay, Marcus, um, do you have anything to add to this? Because uh, this is your speciality. Well, yes. I mean, one, one point I would make about that, on some of those photographs, you see what appears to be the sun appearing in the image itself. Yeah, here and here. There we go. But that is not how the sun would appear when photographed on photographic film. That is a large light rather than the sun. It's, it's, it's masquerading as the sun, and we assume it is the sun because this is taken on the moon. But if you actually examine the center of that white circle, you'll see a filament from above, yeah. which indicates that there were certain areas, certain pictures taken using artificial light. Now, we've got no idea what the scale of those pictures are. It, it could be three feet. It could be 300 feet. It could be three miles. Well, it won't be three miles. It'll be one and a half miles because that's the horizon on, on the lunar surface. We've got no idea what the scale is, which is so it's very hard to, to actually work it out. Now, all of, this, all of this was worked out well in advance on the uh, film scripts, which, which were written in advance. They're called the press packs, they were all done to the nearest second, which is a very suspicious timing. That's what they intended to do. But the Apollo missions didn't carry black boxes, so we don't know what actually happened. We can only assume that NASA are telling us the truth, which I rather doubt, because so many errors have crept into their 
storylines. But yes, I mean, what Blue is saying about the fall off of light is perfectly correct. If you're using right. artificial it light, here. If, if you're using an artificial light, it will fall off. The sun will not fall off. Sunlight is so powerful that, that there's no way it will fall off. Anybody looking at these would say, yes, th there appears to be fall off in some of these pictures, which shouldn't happen if it's being illuminated by the sun. If it's being illuminated by an artificial light, yes, you will get fall off. And some of it is rather more obvious than others. And you can say, well, you can tell what's, what, what size the astronaut is, so you know how big the picture is. But how do we know it's the real astronaut and not a miniature? And this, these are some of the problems that keep arising with analyzing Apollo. This, this, it was a very sophisticated exercise in creating the Apollo archive. Very sophisticated. A lot of work went into it. My view is that it was done at Lookout Mountain Laboratories in California. The, inter the interior shots were done at the same place that Tom Hanks filmed from the Earth to the Moon, Menlo Park, near San Francisco. And some of those images, which we know were taken here on Earth, appear to show a very good facsimile of what we have seen the Apollo images allegedly taken on the Moon. So it is very hard to, it's very easy to say, well, of course they were taken on the Moon. You can tell, look, it's all a weird, you know, the moon surface is very reflective. Yes, it is reflective. 8% is what it reflects. Not a great deal. But then you have to take into account the ability of photographic film to record that amount of light in relation to all the other levels of light in the same scene. And that's why most photographers will use fill-in flash, fill-in lights or reflectors. On the moon, there weren't any of these. You know, guys. Um, all right, it's you know we're going to have to end it soon. I'm afraid it's it's we've been going for so long now. Uh, but this has been really great. It's been it's been really interesting and um, to go through these these issues. So, uh, um, I wish we could carry on all night, but we are going to come back and do another one at some point. So the Apollo detectives yeah. will continue. The case is not yet closed. But in the meantime, I just like to uh, say. Thanks very much to all of you for being on here. And Blue, in particular, Blue, has, uh, it's not easy playing an away game when you're out number <laughs> seven to one. So yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you coming on, mate. It's uh, you know fair play to you. You've got some guts coming on here. And um, so thanks very much for coming on. And, you know, I think we've proved we're not an echo chamber now, haven't we? No one can accuse us of sitting hey. around contemplating our navels. Hey, fair out for that, man. Have as many opposing opinions as you can get. Mm. I, I love that. I hope you'll come back to a future one because I mean I'm sure we can go on talking about some more of these. And the the rest of you, I want to say thanks very much to all of you as well, to Marcus, to Scott, to Randy, to Andy, and Neil. So before we go, just to remind everyone. So Marcus, remind people where we can find out more about you and Nexus Magazine. Okay, mm -hmm. Nexus Magazine, the world's greatest alternative news magazine, required reading for anybody with an open mind. Oh, I like that. <laughs> uh, available in any open bookshop. There are not many of them around, so we're getting a lot of people who are phoning up saying, give us a subscription, I can't buy at the shop. If you want to contact me, two ways to do it. Nexusmagazine.com, press the contact button and address the address an email to me, I will receive it. Or go on to owlis.com, that's A-U-L-I-S, owlis.com, use the contact feature there. That will be sent to me. So I would look forward to hearing from anybody who thinks I'm talking complete rubbish. And also, thank you, also from anybody who thinks I may have one or two valid points to make. Because there are some valid points. And uh, Blue and I have had a very interesting discussion previously about it. And I think we agreed to disagree on certain things, but we did agree on quite a large number of areas. Uh, well, Marcus Allen, thank you very much. Uh, Scott Henderson, you've, uh, you're back for another Apollo Detective, so thank you very much for being on this particular one, the sixth one. If people oh, want to know more about you, me on. you're very welcome. How can people find out more about you and what you do? <clears throat> well, I, I don't uh, keep an active website. I do uh, very few videos when it comes down to it. Uh, most of my stuff is... Uh, just uh, in my own personal research. 
is what I do. And uh, when uh, I have uh, completed an entire session on it, uh, David Percy usually posts my findings on the Hollis website, and that's where you'll find no, great stuff. The detail of my work. Great. So check them out at owlist.com. Um, our new one of our new Apollo detectives, Randy Walsh. If people want to know about you, I know you've got a book. Do you have a website or anything like that? that people sure. Talk about you? Yeah, sure. You could check me out. I have a YouTube channel and I do post um, videos, several videos so far in the Apollo series. I've also actually posted a video of my flying just to prove to people who were calling me a fake pilot. That was kind of fun. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> that's all CGI. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> Is the earth flat? Shut, no, no. Only kidding. So, uh, hey, don't anyway, get me started on that. You can check me, <laughs> you can check me out on um, on my YouTube channel, my Facebook, if um, you want to check me out there, um, at author Randy Walsh. And uh, for those of you who want to send me an email, um, I have an email in the book. Um, you can contact me at author Randy Walsh. So that's uh, two R's, author Randy Walsh at uh, hotmail.com. And uh, so, you know, please do. And I say to the viewers, I do get a lot of emails and a lot of messages on Facebook. And I try to get to as many as possible. But sometimes it's not possible, but as many as possible. But uh, and of course, I have my second book coming out. I'm hoping it'll be out by June or July. It's a bit of a slowdown right now, given the uh, situation in our respective countries. Hopefully that will end soon. But uh, I just want to say my first time here on uh, Apollo Detectives, I really enjoyed it, especially the spirited debate we've had, um, including uh, my debate with uh, Maddox. Quite enjoyed that, too. So um, so cheers to everyone. And I will be back if I'm invited. You'll be very welcome back. Randy Walsh, thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Chaplin is one of our producers and also a radio show host. So, um, Andy, tell us a bit about that. Um, yeah, well, I, I uh, help co-host a paranormal peep show with uh, Neil. And, yeah, there's various things, kind of uh, topics that we go into, not just the moon landings, but spooky, wooky, woo-woo stuff as well. Um, not much else to say, really. I'm just kind of looking forward to this whole virus <laughs> situation winding down and um, having some kind of normality in life. I hope so. The next Tuesday is going to be quite normal because I'm going to be a guest on the Paranormal Peep Show. So yeah. uh, keep a look out for that. <laughs> okay. uh, so thanks, Andy. Thank you very much. Trevor Weaver. Hello. He's, he's been a bit quiet today, but um, he's not on all of them. But uh, what, where can people find out more about you and what you do? Uh, basically, <clears throat> from the books, really. That's all I have. Uh, there's a website that goes with each book. Yeah. As I said, there will be a new book out, I hope, in June this year. Right, you are. We'll look out for that. And um, the, the man without whom the Apollo Texas would simply not exist, Neil Geddes Ward. How are you? Where do people find out more about you? Well, they can find me on Facebook, Neil Geddes Ward. Um, is easy enough, I hope. And uh, if anyone wants to email me, they can... Uh, email me at neil n e i l at geddesward g e w d e s w a r d dot co dot uk. I'll put the uh, the text on the screen in the edit. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for everybody taking part, and I'd also like to point out that all the people here uh, that have taken part, they didn't just start off on the on the foot thinking everything was fake. They actually, everyone here started off on the foot thinking that everything was absolutely true. And uh, so we all believed Apollo at one point and then various things started to slip. The mask started to slip for some of us sooner than others. And that's what prompted us to research a little bit more into it. We went in with an open mind, I guess. I mean, some of us went in skeptically. I certainly was skeptical of the whole thing for quite a while. But as I've delved in more and seen more research, um, things have certainly opened up a lot lot more for me to to realize that perhaps we didn't really go at all certainly things that have shocked me that some of the things i've seen and and we've had obviously covered that in a lot of our previous presentations for anyone that uh, wants to see more but yeah, thank um, you very much for everyone for joining thank you and i'll look forward to being on the paranormal peep show with you as well and also finally a blue earth thing oh, where can people quick. find out about your videos you make on your definitely your filmmaker yeah, yeah, definitely. Also, you said that everybody here started out believing that it was real and now things are fake. I'm actually the opposite. I actually started off thinking it was fake and now believe it's real. 
<laughs> hey, you know, <laughs> yeah, my, my, actually, my, my pop, my, my granddad, he was a, he was a massive conspiracy theorist and like, and I, I idolized him when I was young and I still do, but like he, he believed on a bunch of conspiracy theories and he taught me all of them when I was a kid and I got into them kind of hard and that's kind of why I have this interest in this topic and everything like that. But yeah, I used, when I was like, uh, young, like 10, 12 and stuff like that, I was like JFK, uh, moon landing, all, the, all of them. Uh, well, and all of them, and then I, I your, your Christmas dinners must have been either really interesting or an absolute nightmare. Oh, no, that's <laughs> the that they were. But, yeah. uh, that's, I know what it's like to have family that don't agree with you, but you know, it's interesting, Blue, like you, you went in the kind of opposite direction. Or, yeah. People, you know, both sides in this debate make converts from each other. I've noticed that. Yeah. But your your yeah. YouTube your YouTube channel is, um, can people find it very easily on YouTube? Very. If you just type in Blue Earth thing, like the color, yeah. the planet, and then thing, um, there you go. You're going to find it. And I'm, I've currently got two series that I'm running. I'm, I'm built currently building an observatory. <laughs> yeah. It's just that. That's what I, my image looks like. There you go. Nice but I'm currently building an observatory down in Montgomery. And so I'm, I've got a series of videos on that and that building of that. And then I have another one called the NASA files in which I'm just taking just interesting topics that I find in NASA and files that I find from the library at on campus. Cause we have like, seven we have like i think seven shelves stacked full of nasa files like straight <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty insane actually there's thousands of them and so i'll pick one that looks interesting and then i'll i'll do one i think the next one is going to be the uh plan nasa's plan to put an observatory on the moon Blimey. <laughs> it's, it's well, like an actual it's like an actual manned observatory that they had planned and drawn out and the, ran the logistics of it working and they just decided, you know what? It's easier to put a telescope in orbit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's quite that's quite something. Well, yeah. thanks very much. Uh, that's a Blue Earth thing as well. And I myself, I'm Ben Emily Jones, and you can find me at Hapanwo, H-P-A-N-W-O, that's Hospital Reporters Against the New World Order. And I'm the author of the Roswell Rising, a novel of disclosure, and its two sequels and several other things as well. Check me out online. But this has been Apollo Detectives number six. Thank you all for taking part, and thank you everyone at home for watching. Stay tuned because there's more to come. Thank you.